chance to filter in. Well, wow, got a lot of participants. We do, we do. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Yeah. I see Chafe there. Bill. <laughs> Bill, why don't you go ahead and turn on your camera for us? Hey, Bill. There you are. And your sound. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Paul. Hey, Bill, Bob. you gotta. You have to unmute, Bill. Bill. Bill, you need to unmute your. Okay. There, there you we go. go. All right. Okay. We're good to go. Okay. I'm going to give it maybe one more minute to let um, some more folks filter in. <laughs> hey, Bill, I can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it, Paul. All right. How are you doing? Well, I'll tell you, this has been a uh, harrowing effort to try to get on this call, but I'm I'm here. You made it. Yes. And Bob, I've left you about five messages on your phone. Oh no, yeah, my phone was dead. Sorry. I... Do I need to listen to them before we start? No, nope, I just wanted to know how to get on. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Well, we made it, and I'm going to go ahead and, and start things off. So first and foremost, let me welcome everyone who's in attendance this afternoon or, or morning, depending where you are in the world. Uh, my name is John Gartrell, and I serve as the director of the John O. Franklin Research Center for African and African American History and Culture and the David M. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Duke University. And I'm really, really excited to uh, be one of the, the co-planners of this event this afternoon. Um, and thank you all for carving some time out in, in your busy schedules and days to not only uh, participate in this, but also to watch from wherever you are, whether it's on campus at home or on a cell phone, and hopefully you're not driving, or if you have, are driving, you've pulled over to the road or on the side of the road. So thank you all so much for, for being a part of this. Uh, so this program is reflections on uh, chronicling Behind the Veil. And Behind the Veil, for those who, who don't know, is an oral history project that took place here at Duke University in the early 1990s. And it was uh, emanated from the Center for Documentary Studies here at Duke University, which serves as one of our co-sponsors for this program today. Uh, the project was groundbreaking in its efforts to um, record the stories of African Americans who lived and remained in the South during the era of Jim Crow. And the, the span of, of the, the interviews and, and the, the people that were recorded, uh, the stories trace in many, in some cases, all the way back to descendants of enslaved people through uh, the, the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and it, it was, uh, as I mentioned before, a groundbreaking project where uh, a cohort of graduate students were trained and and then sort of deployed into almost 20 locales throughout the the, the U.S. South uh, to record these stories. And the project was able to render uh, over a thousand interviews. Um, and um, we in in 2021, the, the Franklin Research Center was honored to receive a National Endowment for the Humanities grant to digitize the oral history collection, which includes the audio recordings to transfer them from cassette tapes to digital files, as well as close to 2,000 uh, photographic slides. So digitizing those photographic slides, as well as uh, some of the project records. Uh, and that digital collection will be launching in 2024. Uh, and so this program today is a gathering of the participants of the project, both the planners and then the, the students who were deployed to record uh, those stories to allow them to talk a little bit about their experiences working on the project and um, some of the lessons learned and, and how it was executed and, and the things that they continue to take with them throughout their respective and personal journeys. Uh, I'm going to drop something in the chat to the audience so you can read more about 
uh, the grant project. Um, but I'm going to also now introduce our first panel for the afternoon, which um, is going to talk a little bit about the origins of the project. Uh, our moderator is uh, Professor Paul Ortiz, who's a professor of history and the director of the Samuel F. Proctor All History Program at the University of Florida. Uh, Bill Chafe, who is the Alice Mary Baldwin Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History at Duke University. And Bob Korstad, who is Professor Emeritus of Public Policy at Duke University. And I will turn it over to you, Paul, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, John, and, and thank you, Brianna. And first of all, I want to say how honored I am to be able to be here with so many incredible people. I'm looking at the chat bar, and I'm, I'm getting star, uh, uh, starstruck. <laughs> you know, and I'm uh, certainly here with my former dissertation advisor, um, um, Bill Chafe and Bob Korstad, you know, original uh, faculty advisors on the project. I'm just so excited to learn um, and, and to remember. And I just cannot believe, Bill and Bob, it's 30 years. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. Um, I, I wanted to make some kind of opening remarks and then go right into um, some questions. You know, one of them is to just think about the moment that we're in now, about the incredible people who are here, uh, who are going to be panelists, who are going to give their reflections on what it was like to do the interviews. And then again, the people joining us, I'm seeing some people from the Proctor program and some great colleagues from across the, the, the world uh, joining us. I'm sure others will join us as well. But at the outset, I want us to also think about colleagues uh, who are no longer with us, um, who did such incredible work on this project. Um, and I think we should all feel free to, to talk about you know, those colleagues as well. Um, I'm thinking today of Leslie Brown and you know, when I started as a grad student at Duke, I mean, Behind the Veil was my one and only research assistantship my entire time as a grad student, right, Bob? I mean, I didn't even TA uh, <laughs> because there were just so many oral histories to do, and we were constantly in the field. And I'll never forget the first day I showed up at the Center for Documentary Studies, which at that point was in the snow building downtown. Remember that, Bill? Yeah. Uh, and um, I met Annie Balk and Leslie Brown, uh, two of the most important uh, colleagues and dear friends of my entire career. And the first assignment they gave me was to hand me a piece of paper and say, here's some names of African-American elders we did an interview last summer. They're in Eastern North Carolina, go to it. Um, it was a little more complicated than that, but um, you know, it was just, to for me as a young grad or younger grad student to be able to work directly with Leslie Brown and Annie Valk, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was just such an incredible stroke of luck for me personally and professionally. And I just want to thank both Annie um, and Leslie, and of course acknowledge that that we lost Leslie a number of years ago. But but her spirit animates this entire um, conference, I believe, and her her great work up building Durham. Uh, one of the best texts in African American history. Um, two other people I want to kind of um, get us, you know, to think about was that, and I'm going to ask um, Bob and Bill more directly about this um, as well, is Leon Litwack and John Hope Franklin. And I remember one of the first assignments that Leslie Brown and Annie Vault gave me as a new grad student working on the project in 1993 was to listen to this incredible conversation between Professor Franklin and Professor Litwack. Um, and I want us to see if we can kind of go back at some point to, to think about that. But I thought we could start, um, uh, Bill and Bob, if you wouldn't mind, you know, a little unconventionally and start with, with your personal backgrounds first individually and tell us a little bit about your background, you know, personally, professionally, and kind of what was your journey to... Mm -hmm being founders of Behind the Veil? Like what led you based upon your, your upbringing, your academic work, et cetera, to, to really get this project together, to write the grant, to kind of think through how it would work? Uh, Bill, would you like to go first? Okay, thanks. Uh, well, I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts in a working class neighborhood, which was very segregated. Uh, there were two blocks of white families uh, for six, uh, from Central Square to the Charles River, 98% uh, Roman Catholics. 
there were 15 blocks of bl totally black uh, students on the other side, po population on the other side. And on the um, the other side, there was uh, totally uh, 15 blocks of Italians and Puerto Ricans. But we all went to the same schools. We were not segregated in schools. And so I grew up playing with uh, uh, black kids and Puerto Rican kids uh, in the afternoons. We never went into each other's houses, but we played together. And uh, that was important. And then I was very active in my church, First Baptist Church of Cambridge. And our youth director was someone who every Sunday night for four years during high school talked about the social gospel. What would Jesus do if faced with a situation involving prejudice, discrimination, inequality? Um, and from there, I went on to Harvard as a commuter student uh, and took a bunch of great courses on social issues. And then in my senior year, uh, decided I would write my senior thesis on W.E.B. Du Bois. So I spent eight months writing a thesis on Du Bois, which I fortunately got a magna cum laude for, uh, and went through all of his papers and things like that. And that was a very direct reflection of what I'd been through uh, during my youth and my, and my church experience. I then um, I went to New York City, went to seminary for a year, uh, and continued to be involved in talking about social issues. And then I taught at a private high school for a couple of years. And uh, in 1965, one of my students in my class said, you know, you're always talking about equality and social change. Um, why don't you go, to, why aren't you in the civil rights movement? And so the next day I signed up with the Northern Student Movement uh, and we all went to, uh, a, on a, to, to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, as part of the Selma to Montgomery March. And for two and a half weeks, spent our time uh, setting up places for people to stay, where they were going to eat, et cetera. And that was an extraordinary experience because I already began to see in the spring of 65 uh, some of the tensions in the movement between the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So the SNCC people were often referring to Dr. King as the Lord uh, in a very sarcastic kind of way. And so this is a year before Black Power, but there was already the seeds there. So I basically uh, started to be deeply concerned with doing more work Scotland, from a scholarly point of view on civil rights. And uh, uh, basically, when I finally got a job at Duke University, uh, along with Larry Goodwin, uh, we were both five months out of graduate school, five months. And we were able to start the oral history program in 1971. We were able to get a half a million dollar grant from Rockefeller to recruit black and white graduate students to conduct interviews with activists in the community who started the civil rights movement. And so from 71 on, we had this program that eventually graduated 38 PhDs, uh, half, most of them black. Half of them uh, published their dissertations as books and 16 of them won national book awards. So that's the origins of how uh, I became involved in the movement. Uh, as soon as we started the oral history program, I started to write uh, my book based on oral histories as well as written sources on the Greensboro sit-ins and how those sit-ins led to the formation of SNCC. Uh, and that was the beginning of a long history of writing about issues of race and justice. Thank you, Bill. Bob, how about how about your your intellectual yeah. trajectory? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Paul, uh, and everybody for uh, being here. Um, so I grew up in North Carolina. I was born here. Uh, my uh, folks, my father was from Northern Minnesota. My mother was from Charleston. They met during World War II when they were. Uh, and got involved in a, uh, a strike among the American Tobacco Company uh, workers in Charleston. It was the uh, on that picket line that the uh, anthem "We Shall Overcome" was first sung, and they were, you know, helping the the strike uh, effort. Uh, after the war, my father, uh, my mother, my father worked as the business agent for local twenty. I mean, for uh, food and tobacco workers in Memphis. Uh, 
which uh, Mike uh, Honey has written so extensively about. Uh, and my mother was a social worker. Eventually, uh, he got promoted to uh, regional Southern Regional Director and moved to first Chapel Hill and then to Winston Salem. And then after the union at uh, R.J. Reynolds, which uh, they built in the night, not my parents, but the workers there had built in the 1940s, uh, was really the victim of uh, anti-communism and a variety of other things. Uh, they decided to stay in North Carolina. And I grew up in Greensboro. Uh, I went to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the late 60s. You know, was involved in the civil rights movement, the student movement there. Uh, spent a few uh, years in New York at the graduate uh, at the New School for uh, the graduate school at the New School for Social Research, uh, and then um, thanks to Bill and Larry, came back to North Carolina and uh, uh, had a fellowship at the Oral History Project at Duke, uh, and within a year or so, uh, uh, enrolled as a graduate student at UNC uh, Chapel Hill in the uh, history department. Um, and so I, you know, my first introduction to a lot of these issues was working with Bill and Larry and also talking with all the marvelous graduate students that they had around them and uh, who were already doing uh, oral history research and writing about the civil rights movement, uh, both in North Carolina and other places. Um, and then when I got to UNC, uh, I got involved with a Southern World History Project uh, and eventually um, worked on a book uh, like a family, The Making of a Southern Cotton Mill World, which uh, relied extensively on uh, oral sources. Uh, and that was a really, uh, you know, kind of life changing moment for me, uh, both in the use of oral history, but also in collaborative work. I mean, this is a book that's written by six people, um, and uh, I've continued to do that. And then uh, for my dissertation, I ended up writing about uh, the union in Winston-Salem that my father had been involved in and many others. And I'd known about the union growing up because uh, my parents had been involved in kind of the Southern left and uh, even after the after they left the the work there, uh, you know they had friends from Winston Salem who were constantly in and out of our house. African Americans, whites who'd been organizers, rank and file workers. Uh, but I never, and I knew it was an important event, but I never really knew very much about it. And I started off to to learn that, uh, learn about it. And the only there were very few written records. Uh, so many people had thrown things away. There was just not a lot of archival material, at least at, at first. And so I really relied on oral history interviews. Uh, and I think there was a, the moment I was interviewing a lot of union leaders. Uh, and then there was a moment when I uh, started doing revisions on my dissertation where I really needed a much better understanding of what the African American community in Winston Salem was like before the uh, the organization in the 1940s, uh, and realized that you know so a lot of African American oral history had been focused on the Civil Rights Movement, but relatively little on the period before that time. Um, and I think when I finished my dissertation. Uh, I started talking with uh, Ray Gavins, uh, who is the other uh, co-director, and Bill, you know, about this, the kind of lack of real documentation of, of uh, African-American life. And uh, that was really the kind of foundation for me, or the stimulus for me to start to start thinking about a project like this. All right. Thank you, Bob. And you mentioned... Ray Gavins, um, and, and uh, one of the core faculty uh, advisors of Behind the Veil. And uh, I wonder as we transition to talk specifically about putting together the Behind the Veil um, uh, project and then the grant, um, if we could take a few moments to really to remember um, Professor Ray Gavins, because uh, he was a giant, is a giant mm -hmm. in US history and African American history. Um, he was one of my uh, um, dissertation committee members. Uh, he really taught me African-American uh, history. 
in such a rigorous way and taught so many people here, right? Mm -hmm. As we, in, in this reunion, I can see a lot of colleagues who are right. in seminars with me. And Ray, one of the things that Ray Gavins emphasized, I remember in his seminar, uh, in his graduate seminar at Duke was, was learning about, and Bob, this kind of gets to your point about oral history, you know, learning about the ways that in terms of African-American working class histories, you can't really, you can't learn those histories without oral history uh, in certain ways. And, and Ray Gavin's really emphasized, you know, John Blassingame's work. Uh, he emphasized the importance of going back and reading the 1930s uh, WPA ex-slave interviews. So, so he had a really big impact on this, right? Absolutely. Ray was uh, the first, one of the first black faculty members of Duke. Um, that number has expanded dramatically in the last 30 years, but uh, Ray was fantastic, and he was uh, really co-director in some, so many respects, uh, the work of our oral history program, uh, because we had, well, you mentioned uh, Leslie Brown and Annie Bonk and others. I mean, uh, uh, this was such an extraordinary group of people, uh, and Ray was, along with Larry and me, involved in all of their work. Uh, and he was a terrific scholar, a wonderful friend, uh, and unfortunately died a few years ago um, at a very younger, at a much younger age than, than he should have. Um, but anyway, he was fantastic as a, as a colleague uh, and was part of the breakthroughs that took place at Duke in terms of eventually uh, dr dramatically increasing the number of Black uh, faculty members at Duke. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, uh, you know, I hadn't, I'd taken a class with Ray and talked to him even when I was at uh, UNC. I took probably half my classes at Duke uh, and had gotten to know Ray. And uh, there were a lot of things that, uh, you know, he was very interested in North Carolina at that point. Mm -hmm. That was the uh, subject of his first book, but that's what he was spending a lot of time on. And and he was really, he was thinking about a lot of the same kinds of uh, issues that we were. And he'd been working like with the students that Bill and Larry had recruited, uh, many of whom were doing uh, oral history based projects about the civil rights and mm -hmm. African American struggle in North Carolina. Um, and, uh, you know, Ray was, uh, the, the, the thing I loved about Ray, one of the things I loved about Ray was he, he always he was he could always ask the kind of questions that needed to be answered when you were doing this research, uh, partly from his lived experiences, but partly but just from his rich knowledge of archival sources and the secondary literature. Uh, when we were sitting down, you know, working on any part of this, uh, you know, Ray always have I got you know notes. I'd already have always have questions that he had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, posed to us that we needed to be thinking of in more detail. And I think particularly when we started, you know, we 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 designed the project to uh, eventually, and I think we need to talk a little bit about the steps that we do that, but to look at a lot of aspects about uh, African-American life in the South. So we organized it around jobs, around region, around, you know, we had these various topics that we wanted. Uh, and I think that Ray really helped us see where those, what the areas of interest and the concern that we should be focusing on. And that was, I think, very, that was really helpful to the whole project. Excellent. And Bob, yeah, I, I, we should eventually talk about, you know, kind of the intellectual, I mean, well, it was the interview guide as, as I experienced it, you know, what were the questions, what were the the key themes uh, on the way to doing that, uh, one of the the documents that that Leslie and Annie introduced me to, again week one when I arrived in, in Durham in 1993, was this incredible conference that you all put together that reads like a you know who's who of African American history and you know again Leon Litwag, John Hope Franklin, uh, Robin G D G Kelly, just this incredible group of people. And I remember just listening on cassette. <laughs> that, that everyone remembers cassettes and it was interesting <laughs> that BTV you know is an analog project and John mentioned that you know it was recently digitized it but um can you tell us a little bit about that that conference because I, there's been so many legends about it 
um, so many people have talked about, like, why was it important just beyond this incredible group of this incredible cast of, of characters? Why was it important in terms of thinking about what would become the major themes of, of Behind the Veil? Well, the conference took place, you know, well into the oral history program's history, but we were able to benefit from uh, participants in that program being part of the conference and being able to interact with all these incredible historians who we brought together that summer uh, <clears throat> to talk about what the, what should be the cutting edge issues that we engaged in the in the next ten years of our of our of our program. Uh, and it was really kind of an amazing group of people. And I think that uh, the degree to which, I mean, this was a, definitely a multiracial, probably half black, half white conference uh, with well-known historians, including, as you said, John O. Franklin, Leon Litwack. Um, and John, John Hope was such an incredible figure. Uh, he, he actually came to Duke to teach uh, after spending a couple of years at the National Humanities Center, where I was also, and we were able to persuade John Hope to come to Duke, <clears throat> where he spent the rest of his life teaching. <clears throat> and he was an amazing figure, uh, always uh, engaging students, uh, making his home available for people to come and talk with him, even after he retired. Uh, and he was just an extraordinary person. That conference really kind of validated all the work we were doing, and uh, extended our network of people to people for our students to contact with, be in contact with. Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing uh, we did when uh, Bill and Ray and then in, in conjunction with the Center for Documentary Studies, which we can talk about later, but, uh, you know, one of the first things we did was start talking about the about the idea of this project with people who were here locally. So I was just looking in the the introduction to uh, uh, remembering Jim Crow uh, or the, the acknowledgments in there. And actually you can find the, the, the listing of the dozens and dozens and dozens of people who worked on this project. But Robin Kelly was here at the at UNC on a postdoc that year. Um, I remember a lot of conversations that involved Julia Scott, uh, other people in the, at Duke and at UNC. And so we we started off with a you know with a group of people around here, and then it became, uh, I think, obvious to us that in order for this to be a really substantial project uh, uh, that was going to uh, you know kind of look at the whole South, we weren't going to just look at North Carolina or you know our local communities. You know, we really needed to to know what the kind of the you know where the state of the the scholarship was and we did not we didn't notice that self but there were a lot of people working on these issues at, at, at that point and bringing those people to North Carolina Central uh for a few days for a weekend uh we had you know these public addresses of, or uh, you know addresses by people by many people but we also had small group discussions in which uh, you know, people were given given different uh, uh, prompts, uh, and then you know some of the questions that we ended up using for our interview project really came out of those discussions. Uh, you know, people using the expertise that they'd been developing. What kind of what kinds of things that they want to know, not just us, uh, about the African American experience uh, during this period of time. Um, so I think that, and also it was just a, you know, an incredible boost to the energy that we had for this after having all those people here. And mm -hmm. it also gave us, you know, lots of connections that we might not have yeah. had as we were looking for graduate students, as we were looking for places uh, and people to interview. Yeah. You know, one of the things you mentioned um, earlier, Bill, um, was the importance of your earlier experiences in the oral history uh, uh, program with Larry Goodwin. And I wanted, you know, as we kind of fast forward to think about how Behind the Veil worked, there's some key terms that both of you um, have, have mentioned or kind of, you know, key words. You know, one of them um, we'll talk about kind of going forward, I'm sure we'll talk about the whole, our whole conference is 
you know, the importance, the role of historically black colleges and universities mm -hmm. in the life of the project. <clears throat> Center for Documentary Studies, um, uh, multiracial graduate teams, both of you have emphasized the element of being, uh, the importance of being multiracial graduate teams. Um, one of the things um, I like us to think about too, is the unique, and again, from my own experience, and now my experience as a director of an oral history program, the great emphasis that 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 the two of you and Ray Gavins placed from day one on not just graduate training, but graduate leadership, because it was mm -hmm. because the three of you made it clear to us grad students that part of the expectation was, you know, we do this cutting edge research based upon this, the, these intellectual models, these guides that you'd establish for us. But there is also an expectation that we would use the, the, the experience to build our own academic and intellectual um, careers. Um, but before we kind of get to that, um, Bill, walk us through, uh, well, let me back up. Why would the National Endowment for the Humanities support a project like this at the time? I mean, you had significant grant writing experience, of course, leading up to it, but why, I mean, this was a big grant. For night, you know, for the early '90s, like, how did you make that? How did the the team make that happen? Well, you know, for, for first of all, we got our first grant in '71 when we when Larry and I came to Duke, and it, it it's something which is really quite remarkable that two guys who are five months out of graduate school can come into a established department in a big university and have the freedom to pursue a brand new project which no one had heard about before. And uh, to be able to get half a million dollars from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Now, that was partly just good luck, but part of it was also the fact that we had terrific support from the Department of History and from the president of Duke University at that time, Terry Sanford, uh, who actually was very helpful to us in giving us support. Um, I think the most important thing really in our program at that point was this, the sense of community that we were able to establish. Uh, with Ray and Larry and, and myself, uh, and then subsequently Bob, and then uh, how much time we spent together. Uh, we were in a sort of an old uh, office building with a terrific uh, assistant secretary, Secretary Thelma Kithgart, um, who was very close to the students. Uh, and we, we had all kinds of social get togethers and we had social space together. Uh, that really enabled us to have a, a real sense of community. And uh, our students would get along very well with other students in the department. And uh, we quickly established the kind of legitimacy and expertise that was well-respected across the university. Uh, so someone like Terry Sanford, uh, who was president until 81, was really very, very supportive of all of us <clears throat> and, and put his 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 backing behind us too yeah i think the you know in a in a so there's a rich history at duke already uh and then you've got and then you know as i come into this project uh you know the history of the southern world history program at chapel hill uh you know which by that point was uh almost 20 a few years younger than uh than bill and larry's program uh had been experimenting with all kinds of of oral history projects uh i'd learned uh a lot in that in that process um and so we had uh you know we had those we had kind of in a way both of these these programs to uh and the and the the success of those programs to draw on uh, and then we had this new thing called the Center for Documentary Studies, which, uh, you know, which was housed at Duke, uh, but also had, had drawn on resources at Chapel Hill and other places, too. Um, and that was an exciting new thing. And I'm sorry that Iris can't be here to, to talk about all the, the ways that, uh, you know, that 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 was important. Uh, I think that uh, I think that that combination uh, of uh, of resources that they had and the fact that we'd kind of we've done our work kind of 
you know, we kind of planned the process. We didn't just go to to the NEH for a, a you know a big multi year project. We started with this conference. We started then we had a curriculum development uh, project. We were working with African American scholars around the South. Uh, then we had a summer institute, and in which in which we brought. Uh, faculty members from historically black colleges and from uh, African-American studies programs at, uh, at uh, white colleges together for, for, I don't know, three or four weeks uh, one summer. Mm -hmm. So we did it in stages and we, and, and you know, we're involving, I, I, we're involving so many different people. We're getting that kind of input, but we're also, developing that sense of community that Bill is talking about over a wide range of, you know, over the whole South at Jackson State, at Emory, at, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, one college after another. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think that the the response and the feedback we got from NEH was, you know, this is, this is a big project. This is ambitious. <laughs> Nobody's ever done anything like this, but, but these people have, they've they've done this the right way and we got you know bill did most of this interaction but we got a lot of good advice from neh about how to do this and how to do it right how yeah. not to do it wrong which was to you know to try to do everything at once um and i think that's i think one of the big successes of this is with, that we took our time and we engaged so many different uh people in the process and we also were able always to have colleagues from <clears throat> Carolina and from North 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 Carolina College uh, yeah. and, and NC State. We we basically involved people throughout the entire North Carolina community, uh, and that made a big difference, I think. And uh, um, you know, uh, interestingly enough, <clears throat> the oral history program at UNC uh, started uh, after we gotten off the ground. And they called. Uh, they called me and said, "Do you know anybody who would be good to do oral history uh, here at UNC?" And I said, "Yeah, I do. I went to graduate school uh, with a terrific person named Jacqueline Hall, uh, who happens now to be Bob Corstad's wife, uh, and she was then recruited uh, to UNC to head their oral history program. And we had a constant interaction uh, and met on a regular basis. So it." It was really a, a larger community effort uh, with our students taking part along with faculty members uh, and becoming a, a kind of cutting edge community. I want to uh, spend some time, Bill and Bob, thinking about the different elements of that community. Both of you have talked a lot about community. And when you sent the graduate teams out each summer, you know, the summer of 93, 94, 95, when you, when you sent us out to do this research, uh, many of us ended up, were literally housed at historically black colleges and universities. So um, I see uh, my dear colleague, Doris Dixon uh, in the chat. And I remember in, uh, you know, being at Florida A&M, uh, working with uh, James Eton, who I think had a connection to the oral history program and uh, James Eton, when when our team knew him, was a director of the Black Archive, actually the founding director of the Black Archives at Florida a &M University. Um, I was on a field team that also worked at Tuskegee University um, and also at Mississippi Valley State University, which was one of the newer um, HBCUs in the South. So I wonder if both of you could talk about the importance of really anchoring the project, um, both in, in having us working at many of us, uh, many of our teams working at HBCUs, mm -hmm. why that was important, you know, kind of both in terms of, of community and also intellectually and kind of how those intersect. Well, we frequently went to conferences at places like Jackson State and Mississippi, and uh, we would be part of a, uh, a community that would continue to be in touch with each other, uh, even though we were not necessarily uh, able to see each other that often. Um, but we'd meet at conventions and we would uh, have conversations and uh, be part of really a mutually supportive network. Um, that mutually supportive is the key. Uh, always kind of knowing where you could turn for help uh, and how we could operate together. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the, I hadn't thought about this before, but one, one of the interesting things is that uh, the Southern Historical Association uh, was, was, uh, I think in the process of, of really uh, starting to encompass black scholars and black and, uh, and the uh, teachers at uh, historically black uh, colleges in a way that they hadn't in the past. So that, uh, you know, Freddie Parker at North Carolina Central uh, is taking his students to the uh, to Southern uh, Southern History Association meetings. Uh, there are a number of other uh, people, you know, people at HBCUs on the panels, and uh, you know, I think that's one one of the first places we that, that uh, where we started building some sense of this. And then we reached out and got uh, you know we're very uh, Alfredine Harrison, who was at the, at Jackson State, was very. Mm -hmm. Uh, a very uh, important consultant to, to our project and um, uh, had 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 contacts with uh, with uh, NEH and had done some really important would do some really important work herself uh, knew a lot about exhibits and public history that I think we didn't know that much about um, and, you know, we tried to develop a few, you know, individuals at places around the South so that, you know, when we went out and started picking communities and picking schools, we didn't go someplace where we didn't know anybody mm -hmm. or that they didn't know, know us. Uh, you know, we, we, it'd been nice to have done even more of that, but I think we did, a, I think given the times and stuff that we did a pretty good job with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Talk, talk with us about your vision of the role, the roles that graduate students would play, you know, in behind the veil. I mean, it, it just occurs to me that there, there are other possibilities here, like thinking in the world of counterfactualism. I mean, <laughs> other people could have done the interviews, other people could have set up the field sites, but um, both of you and certainly Ray Gavins um, and, and advisors felt that grad students should play a, a, a mm -hmm. very important role here. Um, what was your vision and, and your idea behind that? I'm not sure we started off with a vision. I think that we clearly put a great emphasis on students feeling autonomous and feeling as though they could help to shape the, the, their own future. Uh, and they the amount of time we spent together in informal social situations. And that was in some ways, the fact that we had our offices in a different place than most of the history department uh, meant that we had a kind of a building that was our own. And we had lots and lots of gatherings there, which were very, very informal. And I think that the degree to which uh, the students felt uh, I mean, that they, they might not be peers of ours, in terms of their age, but they were peers of ours in terms of our intellectual exchanges. Mm -hmm. And uh, that made a huge difference for both students and for, and, for, and for the people who were that time on the faculty. So that meant, it just meant that we had, a, we had an identity which was communal in nature uh, and which gave us a lot of mutual support for each, for each other uh, and made us such a strong part of the history department. I think also, Paul, if you go back and look at the, you know, the the interview projects that both that were done in the Duke Oral History Project and and the UNC uh, Oral History Program, so much of that was done by by graduate students. Yeah, you know, the interviews themselves, uh, and then you know we had the experience of I had the experience of being one of five graduate students who worked on like a family. And, you know, in which, you know, there was that, that kind of sense of, of communication and trust and uh, of people. Um, you know, I don't, I think that it, it, in a way it almost just came, it came naturally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Ray was important with this in this context too, as, as, a, as a mentor and a guide and a, uh, you know, in a, a you know, a, a person who was close to the to the grad his graduate students, uh, and I think we had, 
you know, we had a lot of, uh, in the same way that people had respected me and us in different ways, uh, I think we had that that same feeling. Um, and, uh, you know, we knew this was going to be a, a, a large project, and it was going to take a lot of people to, to do this work. It was We weren't going to be able to just hire a staff of three or four people and over three or four years have be able to go out and do the kind of work that we needed to do. Uh, and, you know, it just seemed like a really good experience. And then we had the great luck of having uh, Leslie and Annie come on board so quickly. And then you were there in a couple of years. And I mean, you know, you all performed at an incredibly high level as did, you know, the interviewers and the people that came in from other parts of the country, new graduate st students who came into both schools, uh, I think came, you know, both with a pretty good knowledge of African American history, a real passion for it, uh, and a desire to learn uh, the skill. I mean, there, are, you know, lots of dissertations came out of that out of that work uh, that people got him as a you know is a is a great way to get your feet on the ground, um, you know, and and having a project that's right there in front of you, whether yeah. you know wherever you're wherever you're going to work with that. Um, well, the you know, fact that work on Durham is just just one of many examples, I think. Mm -hmm. And the fact that so many of those dissertations within two or three years became books uh, yeah. and that they get such recognition. That was really amazing. Yeah. How did you go about I want to ask um, uh, in a minute, get us to like the interview guide and, and, and really some of the key questions that that you really wanted us to to tackle, you know, the, the 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 lacuna, the silences in the field that needed to be addressed, and how oral history could could perhaps best address those silences. But mm -hmm. um, talk for a few minutes, if you wouldn't mind, about graduate recruitment. And I know this is kind of personal because we're here, right? But I think there's a 30 year. Uh, I think we have the 30 year moratorium is passed on talking <laughs> about uh, recruitment. Like what were what were you looking for? Bill and Bob, in terms of, of grad students uh, potentially to work um, on, on this project. And I'm also thinking here about, Bill, something you said, which is, I think, very important. I don't want us to forget. We were, we were in the Center for Documentary Studies when I arrived. We were not in the Department of History. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really an interesting, important thing. But, but how, how did you think about graduate recruitment for, for Behind the Veil? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we had, uh, again, it kind of draw, I mean, on both the, ex the experiences of both the programs, I mean, uh, uh, you know, students who had a, had some some background, some scholarly background in, in the, the issues. So, uh, you know, people who, who, you know, were, studying or looking at uh, on topics on African American history on the South, people who were interested in the period, you know, the kind of Jim Crow era, not just the civil rights movement. Uh, I think we were looking, you know, we, we looked for a pretty diverse group of people. Uh, we wanted people who were experimental, exper exper experimental, you know, who were willing to, th this is something that, that most very few graduate programs were training people in. I mean, right. we couldn't we couldn't really go out and and we we got some people from Duke and UNC that way. But most college most graduate programs weren't teaching oral history methods. Right. Um, so you know we had to have we had to look for people who had uh, you know had some had some interest and passion for this, and also just some you know interpersonal skills because we knew this was not going to be an easy. <laughs> task and they were going to have people have to get along they're going to have to they're going to be in places that they've never been in their life uh, and they're, they're you know having people coming from duke university going into you know rural mississippi to do interviews is that's you got it takes a certain you know somebody's got some maturity and mm -hmm. uh, you know self-confidence to do that i think yeah i also think that the, the fact that we had the kind of leadership at the top that we had 
opened up the possibilities of moving forward. I mean, I think the fact that Terry Sanford was president and with the history department was headed by Dick Watson, uh, these were both people who were very supportive of young insurgents uh, and willing to back us up uh, when we needed their support uh, and then to reward us with recognition. Uh, I think that, that, but you know, by the end of the 1970s, we were very, very uh, well regarded within the entire university. And uh, I think that that made a great, great deal of, deal of difference. And then I think that uh, by that time, the program had established its own kind of uh, attractiveness. Uh, so we had a, a larger uh, core of applicants and stuff like that. Uh, I just think it was remarkable that we were able to get as many terrific graduate students. And the fact that we graduated uh, 38, 28 published their dissertations as books, that's pretty incredible uh, at any university. Uh, but the fact that, and then they win book awards. I mean, this, this speaks a whole lot to the way in which the community reinforced itself and its members and gave them uh, the sense of ambition as well as uh, achievement that, that made the programs work so effectively. Yeah. Thank you both. Let's think about, let's, let's talk about the, the themes um, that you sent us into the field, or even before being in the field, being in, uh, in, in Ray Gavin's seminar, Bill, I mm -hmm. took your social movement seminar, uh, Bob, uh, Derek Chang uh, and Paul Husbands uh, asked me to give you a shout out. Uh, <laughs> the three of us took you for a very uh, vibrant um, independent study uh, in mm -hmm. labor and working class history. So all, so many of us were in your seminars um, and got a chance to, to get a grounding there. Um, I remember one of the things my grad students today will sometimes ask me, you know, is there a maximum number of books that, uh, that I'm expected to read for, <laughs> uh, with you? And I always think about Ray Gavins. <laughs> one time one of us said, you know, Professor Gavins, is there, uh, is there a limit on the, the amount of books we need to read for an, a field in African-American history? And Ray just kind of laughed and said, no, there is no limit. Just keep reading. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was Ray Gavins. But I mean, all of you had, had published really wonderful works and were already considered to be you know, preeminent um, in, in your field. And so how did you, I mean, what were the themes that you really wanted us to hit the ground with in terms of the interview guide, in terms of the scholarship. Um, I remember one of the things just was that we were constantly told, try to get as much history from African-American elders before the movement. I remember that was kind of a yeah. mantra before the movement, but could you, act, could you help us understand like some of those big themes that you wanted us to, to really pursue in, in, in our interviews? Well, let me, I, I think that uh, you know, first of all, I think we got a lot of that out of the conference and the and the kinds of collaborations we had before we even started doing the interview process. So, uh, you know, if you go back and look at the records, of, you know, of the, the conference at North Carolina Central, you know, in these small discussion groups, and we had we had a recorder for each one of those. And we asked, we asked these groups to actually come up with questions that, you know, you would want a big a, a project like this to, um, you know, to undertake. And then the other thing we had was that, uh, you know, I borrowed liberally from the the interview questionnaires that the Southern World History Program had done on the on the working on the textile industry and and a lot of those interviews I actually we wrote about the textile industry but the interview project was on southern industrialization so there are interviews with african americans working in the tobacco industry furniture uh and so that and we took those uh, we we basically took those uh interview questions and just redesigned them i mean i think leslie and annie did did that if i remember mm -hmm. right um but you know we 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 kind of we kind of took all the you know we kind of gathered all the information and the insights the kind of knowledge the the questions that people have put together and then you know we designed a uh, a project that would try to cover as much of that as possible and particularly cover issues that we didn't think 
uh, had been dealt with very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we, I, I think a couple different things, we, uh, you know, we were looking at work culture mm -hmm. uh, was one of the themes. And, you know, we found, you know, work culture was, you know, in the, in the mines and the mills in Birmingham, but it was also people who were, you know, crabbers and and shrimp fishermen in the you know in the South Carolina low country and we we started realizing the diversity I mean we we kind of thought you know most African American workers were domestic workers or agricultural workers you know and then okay well so we've got some you know industrial workers and they're working in tobacco and the mines and stuff and then we started looking at you know categories in the census and stuff and start realizing maybe they weren't in large numbers, but African-American work culture in the Jim Crow South was pretty, uh, pretty diverse and pretty, mm -hmm. pretty amazing. And we wanted to get a little bit of, you know, a piece of that. And I think, I think this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of, well, I don't know, was as much a directive as anything else if i you know if we don't know something we need to find it out mm -hmm. uh, yeah i think that the other thing is that uh i'm not sure you planned this ahead of time at all but uh the whole idea of getting inside of the community what was what is most important in the community and that led us to kind of an emphasis on you know the role of the church in the black community and how the church spawn uh, both political action, but also uh, social support for each other uh, and how that in turn led to uh, movement uh, activity uh, that was, you know, led, led directly into the civil rights struggle. So I think that 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 whole ultimately that really was kind of the uh, the foundation of the oral history program vis-a-vis -vis the black community. Uh, in retrospect and from a di distance, it looks like anthropology, but it's anthropology with a real sense of what makes up the heart of this community. You know, one of my fondest memories, uh, Bob and Bill, you know, thinking about work culture and, and themes, and, and Bob, you mentioned mine, mines and mills, and I remember arriving in Birmingham in the summer of 1994, you know, working at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute with Professor Horace Huntley, just an, an incredible scholar and, and the, of the staff at the, at the Civil Rights Institute and, and to be there at that time. I remember one of the first people that we interviewed was a retired African-American coal miner by the name of Leon Alexander. Mm -hmm. and, just a, a giant of a man. I remember going to shake his hand for the first time. My hand just kind of disappeared in this enormous, you know, coal miner's hand. And one of the first things that he told me was, um, uh, young man, you heard about the CIO, right? Uh, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. I said, yes, sir. He said, we built that. Black mm -hmm. miners built that. And it was, it was such an incredible experience. And it kind of reminds me of a theme that um, all three of you emphasized to us and, and really it became another one of the major themes of Behind the Veil. Um, and in about 110, we're gonna transition into a Q and A, but as we're, as we're kind of closing here, I wonder if you could talk about um, the A word, agency, uh, because it was contested at the time. I remember Ray Gavins would talk about, you know, look, this is the nadir. This is a period in African-American history when there's tremendous oppression, pressure, you know, how could you talk about agency during this period of time? So, I mean, how, how, what was your view on, on agency and, and oral history and African-American life? I mean, well, now it's much different, right? Because we <laughs> have, as Bill has said, you have these, these scholar, these books, you all have published subsequent books as well, but take us back to the early nineties. Well, I think that's, I think that was the, you know, the one issue where in some ways we made the most, you know, most, most advances in terms of the scholarship and stuff. And uh, because, you know, people, people had really thought about, 
you know, that nothing really changed between uh, disenfranchisement in the late 19th century and the white supremacy campaigns in the civil rights movement. That that was a kind of a static period in African-American life. And, you know, uh, people just had to get along with it, uh, you know. And I think that we'd already, you know, I'd done stuff on Winston-Salem. We'd already had, uh, you know, there's a lot of new scholarship. There was not a lot, but some new scholarship that was starting to uncover um, uh, African-Americans uh, protest traditions mm -hmm. that go, you know, that happened in the midst of Jim Crow. Right. Uh, we're looking at early voter registration drives when everybody mm -hmm. thought, well, we didn't start that until, you know, 1965 or 1960 or something where, where we started finding, you know, people have been finding things that were going on earlier in that, uh, you know, strikes and, and workers protests in the late 19th century, you know, from washerwomen to coal miners to steel mill workers and everything else. But, um, but I think that the basic assumption that people had was that was a a, a period of, of quiet and the civil rights movement just burst, you know, uh, on, you know, burst out <laughs> from nowhere. But I think this is one of the places that I, that we all learn from from Larry and Bill and and the work that they did and their project did in Winston-Salem, I mean, in Chapel Hill which is that I think Larry and Bill have both written about this is that every time the students would go out and do interviews, mm -hmm. they'd come back and <laughs> somebody would say, well, I, I, I interviewed somebody today and the civil rights movement in Chapel Hill started on this day. And then the next day, somebody would come back. No, it started three years earlier than that when there was this protest here. Yeah. I think that one of the things that we went into this project expecting to find and we found it you found it you all found it was that that story in chapel hill was replicated all over the south that's right maybe not in the same ways and some of it in quiet ways that just individuals mm -hmm. did but that <laughs> there was a history here that nobody was talking about or it, you know, it was multi-generational yeah, and that's, you know, and that this process of what Larry called social learning, mm -hmm. which was so critical to me when I had to, you know, finish my dissertation, it's all about the 1940s, and, and I had to go back and write about the 40 years before that, mm -hmm. <laughs> and learn, you know, where, where all this come from, because it yeah. didn't just break out, you know, and I, I mean, and there's a weird way in which this project was an effort to um, address that that's that one question is where did the civil rights movement come from yeah I, you know i don't know I, I mean i don't know how explicit we are in discussing that but as as y'all go went out into the field as we started mm -hmm. looking in newspapers as we started looking at doing archival research i think that that became something that we understood more yeah. and more uh, and the interviews, I think, do a fabulous job of telling that story from community struggles to individual struggles. Yeah. And they those interviews show you the degree to which this movement is definitely multi-generational. It's not something that comes yeah. flying down from the sky. It's because you know, the people who started the sit-ins in Greensboro had been told by their high school teachers that they had never ridden in the back of the bus and they had never gone uh, into a, a, a restaurant uh, that, that was segregated. And that kind of message transmitted also through church ministers and through uh, church organizations just shows the degree to which we were able to un uncover layers of layers of creativity for multi-generate many generations uh, before you get the breakout of the uh, 1950s and 60s. Yeah. Wonderful. These are amazing insights, amazing insights. And, you know, we're going to now start to transition to the Q&A. Yeah, John just messaged me. And um, so Brianna will be reading off questions from the Q&A um, for us to answer uh, when we're ready. 
Um, I got a message um, from my dear colleague, Annie Valk, who I uh, hope she doesn't mind me reading her, her direct message, because I think it's, it's, it bears importance on, on what both of you have just shared with us. Um, Annie says, in my mind, one of the strengths of the collection is that individual interviewers also pursued interviews and questions that hewed closely to their own interests. Uh, E.g. Rhonda's interviews related to beauty parlors as organizing spaces. Uh, Doris did amazing interviews asking women about gender, sexuality, and reproduction, uh, or labor organizing. And so there's a space for us, even though we were part of a larger enterprise, to pursue questions based on our own research interests. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that lends a lot of the, the, the power to why the interviews were so, uh, so uh, in engaging. Yes, and I think that's by structuring the thing, the project the way we did. I think that that kind of assured that kind of independence and that kind of you know uh, effort on people's part. Because mm -hmm. uh, you know if we just done it top down and said here's the list of questions, here's what we want to know, go out and find this, I, you know the collection wouldn't be as rich. I mean I think Annie's absolutely right there. So I see one question in the chat, and uh, Brianna, you're going to uh, go ahead and, and help uh, f and facilitate us, right? Yes, I'm happy to help uh, facilitate. And I also just want to say thank you so much to Bill and Bob and Paul for that wonderful little discussion. It's just really exciting to hear the origins of how this incredible collection came to be. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, all right, I will begin with a question I see from Paul Jeanette. She asks, um, the Behind the Veil collection includes an amazing assemblage of thousands of copies of copy photographs of original images contributed by the interviewees or their families, as well as photos of BTV staff in their travels to regions. How was this visual component in history conceived of in terms of an understanding and expression of history, as well as a research resource? And then she follows that question up with, how was visual history taught or discussed among project participants? And did that change over the course of the project? Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. That, you know, I, I, I'll, I, I could say something about that, but I think Annie is the person to, because I think she and Leslie, uh, you know, had a much better sense of that and and kind of in the training process but but we also had i think about uh somewhat lynn lennemeyer uh who was a, a, a photographer and was doing all this great work with in mississippi and i think that she was god i can't remember exactly she was involved as a consultant in the project in some way and we were looking at some of her photographs and they were you know pictures of people with in their cars and uh, I, I just remember one photograph that she had and we started and and these are, uh, you know, these are kind of Kodak, Kodak pictures that people had and, and she was getting them from people's scrapbooks and some scrapbooks that she found in different ways. And I think that, you know, all, all of our eyes opened, but I think, uh, you know, and so we started you know, we just start, we bought cameras and said, uh, in camera stands. And we, you know, we were at a center for documentary studies. We, we were surrounded by photographers and, and, uh, photographic historians and, and scholars, uh, you know, and we said, well, you know, if you, if you find somebody who's got a great photograph collection, just see if they'll let you copy it. And we were, you know, I don't know if it's the best quality in the world, but, for the time we did, I think we did a pretty good job. Been nice to have one of these fancy scanners, but uh, you know, it kind of just—I don't think it's something that we prepared for. But yeah. we, you know, uh, and again, this is the some of the creativity and the imagination of the graduate students who are out doing the work. Yeah. Uh, you know, they they just dug into it, and I, I think I hope I hope Annie can talk a, a little bit more about that later this afternoon. Annie, are you interested in joining us? <laughs> or comments from people that yeah, you know. yeah. Hi, everybody. I, I can jump in and say just a little about that. And it's a wonderful question that 
has my uh, my wheels turning. And I think, as Bob mentioned, I think the influence of the Center for the Document Center for Documentary Studies was a really important piece of thinking about the visual records. I also think another piece of that was that when we began this work, it was really uh, very early in collections being digitized and made mm -hmm. available online. I have a very vivid memory of Leslie and I going to the public library in Charlotte, North Carolina, when we were uh, getting ready for the first summer's field work. And it was in that public library where somebody showed us the Library of Congress's American Memory Project online. And I had mm. never seen anything like that before. It was new at that point. And I think that really was shaping how we were also just becoming aware of the importance of visual evidence, particularly in relation to the, the new ways in which collections of historical materials were becoming accessible. And I think that was pointing out both the power of visual images and the glaring gaps in the kinds of visual images that were available. The last thing I'd say, um, Paula, your question also references the way in which the Behind the Veil staff were also taking photographs of their experiences. And one thing that I think was as certainly part of how Leslie and I were thinking about the project was also a real, an awareness of the importance of documenting our process and mm -hmm. understanding that not only were we collecting history, but in a way we were making history and that we had some obligation to give future researchers information about the present of the moment in which we were doing all of this work. So I think that that also included thinking about what did these what were these communities like at the moment in which we were there? What who were our interviewers? What, I mean, who were they in lots of different ways? What were they bringing to this process and what were their experiences like? So you know, I think we were very uh, encouraging for the interviewers to be documenting their experiences and adding those experiences either in recordings or in visual, um, new yeah. new photographs and adding those to the collection as well. And uh, I would love to hear more just about how people have used these, the visual record and the photographs that were part of the collection, because uh, it seems like something that uh, there's just an incredible potential for, and I have not a lot of understanding of how it's been made use of. Mm -hmm. I could, I, I could add a little context. Dope. I could add a little context to that question. Um, and Bill, I'll let you, why don't you go ahead, Bill, and, and respond. Well, I just think that that uh, what we've been talking about is the way in which the process of conducting interviews gave rise to its own set of initiatives on the part of people who are doing the interviewing. Uh, and there's no way that we would have anticipated or could have anticipated what the consequences would be, but the students, uh, the people who were doing the oral histories, just ran with it, and that's that. That's what made them such a creative uh, and important part of the entire process. So, just to kind of add a little bit more context um, to the question, Paula is one of our stellar um, archivists here in the Rubenstein Library. She's our visual material specialist in our technical services department. And uh, worked very closely with Paula in 2021 uh, as we were reprocessing the collection to prepare it for digitization. And so her question is poignant because she worked directly with the whole collection, but of course has a special interest because of her specialty in the visual materials. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, in the in my many conversations with Paula, 
we both realized how um how actually I feel underutilized the photos are in the collection. Mm -hmm. I think many researchers know the collection for the interviews themselves. Um, but, and some of this is just because of the medium that the, the, the photos are in slide, like little slide cartridges that they don't get a lot of use and, and they weren't um, as um, intricately described as the interviews were. Uh, so I, I just put a link into the chat to the audience that you can actually view the collection guide and um, access a digital portal where we have 410 of the interviews online currently. But um, I've always wanted to use the photographs more, especially in classes when I do instruction sessions with um, the students here. And the the support that we've gotten from NEH to digitize the full collection will now make those those photographic materials much more widely available. Uh, and I think because they're now going to be transferred from those slides to digital format, people will get a chance to see um, just how rich they are. And mm -hmm. um, Brianna has something for us during uh, our break time in about 10 minutes, but just wanted to lend a little bit more context and talk a little bit more about how those visual materials do get used. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, and, and one of the ways, John, and Annie will remember this, um, we, it's interesting thinking back because those, the visual materials got used or some of them got used very quickly um, in local educational contexts because, again, being at the Center for Documentary Studies, you know, on the edge of campus with actual parking spaces, um, we would often be visited by local um, school uh, classes. And, and there was great projects always running out of the Center for Documentary Studies, um, you know, literacy through photography, student action with farm workers. And um, not infrequently, uh, we would have, you know, middle school uh, classes would come in They'd kind of pile in in the, in the auditorium downstairs, and we would do impromptu lectures on the Jim Crow and the civil rights movement eras. And that's my recollection is, is that's where we use some of the photographic materials first. Mm -hmm. And especially to emphasize the theme that there was, there was more to the Jim Crow South than the black and white drinking fountain signs. And there were family histories. There were, were fraternal lodge histories, there were union local histories, there are women's club um, histories. And these were some of the really incredible photographs that people shared with us. You know, they, they were not the kind of thing you'd usually associate with, with the Jim Crow South, you know, on, on the cover. And I remember, you know, Bob, when we were, when, you know, putting together Remembering Jim Crow, that's another, that was kind of another kind of signal place where it, it, it really, um, the, the the photographic dimensions, the visual dimensions mm -hmm. of BTV really paid off because there's a very rich set of photographs in remembering Jim Crow that typically were not part of a African American history during Jim Crow South, you know, uh, type of book up, up to that time. Mm -hmm. I do implore our audience members to please feel free to ask some more questions um, because if you don't, I will certainly have questions to ask. <laughs> okay, while we're waiting for potential questions to come in, um, something that grabbed my attention while you all were discussing the processes of the origins of Behind the Veil was the spaces in which you uh, sought out interviewees, particularly um, Black churches. And in going through old administrative files, I also noticed that um, care facilities were off, also often accessed. So I was wondering if you all could discuss the, the spaces and routes that you found to be the most fruitful for finding interviewees. Hmm. Wow. Paul, you can answer that better than we can. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think Annie and Leslie were working you know, pretty much year round to identify you know, places, organizations, and again, this, this came out of the scholarship. I mean, if you look at Leslie Brown's book, Upbuilding Durham, you'll see this strong, I mean, another term I remember, Bob, was, you. I think you used the term back in the day, 
of like associational histories, right? right? You, you taught in your seminars that don't just think of people as individuals. I mean, we're individuals, right? But we also have fraternal associations, you know, um, maybe with the union, you know, with the church, uh, with the lodge. One of the things that I I didn't know going in, because when I was growing up, I so you know, I grew up in a shipyard town and I associated lodges like the Elks, uh, the 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 Masons, et cetera, et cetera, with kind of like this like other life that was kind of almost like middle class life but the lodges that you know that we ended up going and working at behind the veil were very different they were mutual aid organizations built by working class people in cities and in rural areas and it took some time but if you could get into to talk to elders who had built um a, a, a knights of pythias lodge um, in rural Gaston County uh, in the Florida Panhandle, that was incredible. I mean, that was a precious space to be in and to talk to people. And um, I remember talking, you know, Cleaster Mitchell was one of my favorite oral history interviews in the Arkansas Delta, and she was just a giant in her community. There, the other thing we learned is, is the importance of women's leadership mm -hmm. on a neighborhood level, you know, whether or not these women elders were parts of associations. I mean, they were the leaders in every neighborhood. And one of the things she, she told us was that, um, we said, what role did the church play in the black community in the Arkansas Delta back in the day? And she said, well, you know, we all were members of these lodges and associations. The, the, the church was there for the people who didn't, who thought they were too good to be members of, of the lodge. That, that's how she explained, it's in the interview. <laughs> And it was really interesting. And so the, the churches were critical, but then getting out, um, using the churches as a base, uh, HBCUs were critical too. You know, in, uh, uh, workers who worked at HBCUs their entire careers you know, had had tremendous experiences to share as well. I think one thing that uh, I'll, uh, the, the, I think locations is really important and where you know, we even if we didn't do the interviews in a you know in a school or a church or something like that, you know that's where we first met a lot of the people, uh, and we had to we had to diversify that uh, at some point because I remember when I think when Leslie and Annie came back from or uh, when the first groups of interviews were done in Charlotte, uh, and you know we had started off talk we we uh, a couple school teachers um and uh we realized that you know we'd gotten into this network of school teachers and they just kept referring us to one other and we we come out of charlotte and the only perfect only job category that we've got that we've documented in any extent are are school teachers which is a small you know percentage of the of the afro-american female workforce uh, and so we had to we had to start looking for you know different places, different networks. Uh, that's a little bit different than location, but but very similar kinds of questions. Of, you know, uh, you don't about where we find people, uh, and <clears throat> so I mean we had to, we had to think about that, and and people were thinking on the ground all the time about that. Mm -hmm. I see that we have a question from Michael. Would you like to ask your question, Michael? Yeah, uh, it's not really a question. Uh, I was just reflecting back on this discussion. In the book I did, Black Workers Remember, in oral history, in the beginning, it, it thanks the uh, Behind the Veil project uh, for kind of stimulating this way of writing about history. And specifically, it thanks uh, Paul Ortiz for helping me to conceptualize the stories of Black workers as a story of its own and make a book out of that. Uh, but before that was um, actually Bob. Uh, when I spent the early 70s from 70 to 76 organizing in Memphis in the Deep South and then went to Howard University and then Northern Illinois University and started combining labor history and civil rights history. And in, I think it was the spring of 1980, I was finishing my graduate work and I went to North Carolina 
and Otto Olson had connected me through Leon Fink to Bob. So uh, I don't, you know, these connections. Wow. And then Bob uh, sat me down with Larry Goodwin and we had a couple of beers and we talked about this question about agency and also spaces, like where do you find people? So then Bob sent me over to talk to his father, Carl Korstad. Carl gave me a list of names, Ed McRae, uh, Red Davis, other people on the left in the South who were in the labor movement. And then I went down to Memphis and I changed my orientation quite a bit and started interviewing. So for my first book, I interviewed at least 33 people, black and white. And then uh, partly because of Behind the Veil, uh, that was like 1993. So somewhere in there, we had that conference. Right. And I started thinking more about uh, you know, Black workers as a group, uh, a certain story that they had mm -hmm. that was distinctive <clears throat> and uh, a little bit different from the Black and white labor history that I was doing. And so anyway, it all kind of evolved. And by the 1990s, then I started really working on that and uh, published Black Workers Remember in 97. But about the spaces issue, what I learned in part was how to introduce yourself to a community when people have every reason to distrust you and not want you to ask them questions. So one of my key interviews was with Clarence Coe, who worked at the Firestone factory, who was a great observer of what goes on at the workplace. And when I first called him, he, he said, what, why are you calling me? Who, who gave you my name? Mm -hmm. Who are you? <laughs> you know, and so first of all, I had to say, well, one of your other union people gave me your name. Oh, then I had to say, I used to be an organizer in Memphis. So I understand, you know, kind of what goes on in Memphis. Oh, why don't you come over to my house? <laughs> Except my wife doesn't want you to come over to my house because I have a heart condition and you'll get me all upset if I start telling these stories. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, oh, God, this isn't going to work. I went to his house, though, and he just poured out his heart for like an hour and a half. Incredible stories. And of course, I taped it. And I sort of got this orientation from that Behind the Veil conference. Make sure you get everything on tape, you know, mm -hmm. and transcribe it. And he sort of opened up a whole world of what went on at the workplace and the importance of unions. Uh, and so what I then discovered was one person led to another person led to another person. And I ended up with scores of interviews of black workers that I was able to then put together a story from the 1920s through the 19. That's great. Uh, and so it's interesting to me to think back, like, how did how did that all happen? And mm -hmm. the combination of people stimulating these ideas among scholars and secondly, the role of unions and black workers in those unions, which I learned some of that from Bob, of course, because he was doing the same thing in yeah. Salem. Uh, and, and also another connection important to me was I spent a year um, with Ira Berlin on the Freedom History Project, where we we're looking at emancipation after the Civil War, which presented a whole nother long, long story about what people did during what Bob was saying. People think of it as stasis before the civil rights movement and when bob and i were both doing our research it was like no labor movement really existed in the south before the so you know in the 30s and 40s it was just so suppressed not true not true at all so and we only learned that by by finding the people I think. yeah yeah thank you so much for sharing that michael that was a perfect segue into our last question from this q a session um from Adolfo Romero, and he asked, um, I would be interested to find out if follow-up interviews have been conducted with the children of the people that were interviewed. Also, what challenges did you face in the South when interviewing the community? Would there be any type of retaliation? Well, you know, I think Adolfo, and this is um, proud to say, I, our assistant director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, and one of our programs at UF has been, um, in, in many ways, Kind of like what many of us are doing here is following up from that work in the 90s and so 
the Proctor program has a project we call the Mississippi Freedom Project. And we started that project essentially by doing what Adolfo was mentioning, which was interviewing children of the people that we interviewed in the 90s. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, one of our, our first stop on the way to Mississippi from Gainesville, Florida, is at the home of Sam and Laura Dixie, who I interviewed in the summer of 1994 as part of Behind the Veil. Uh, Laura Dixie was the retired founding president of the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees uh, Hospital Union uh, in Tallahassee. And she was, the, she was that person who everyone said, if you want to get the history, young man, you've got to talk to Mrs. Dixie. And Laura and Sam Dixie also hosted and protected Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Jr. whenever he came to Tallahassee to visit with his dear friend, Reverend C.K. Steele. And the reason that Dr. King would stay at the Dixie's house was they were well, well equipped, as people said back in the day, to protect Dr. King. And they were in the middle of a black working class community um, that could defend itself from, from mm. Ku Klux Klan oh. terrorism. So even to this day, but, but see now, of course, both of them have, have passed away. And so we're working directly with their children and their children host our, our students to do oral histories in this next generation. So, so that's one direct uh, connection. But I think both of these questions, Brianna, are questions we can continue working into the next panel, certainly the challenges of doing the interviews the, the types of communities um, and, and those as, as, uh, as well. Well, I want to thank uh, Paul and Bob and Bill for this wonderful panel and um, all the conversations. I, I learned a lot in terms of like the origins and how things got started. And this is going to be exciting to hear as we flow into our next panel, which is going to be on experiences from the field uh, conversations with the Behind the Veil interviewers. We're going to take about a 10-minute break in between this panel and the next, and I'm going to ask Brianna if she can share with our audience uh, a clip of two interviews from the collection. So you're going to hear the voices of Margaret Kennedy Goodwin and Melvin George and uh, see some of the, the photographic slides that we uh, had just mentioned earlier in our conversation today. Uh, and then I'll come back on and our next panel will have their cameras on and be ready to have their conversation about experiences from the field. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Bill, so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Fabulous. And Bill, I'm going to ask you to uh, turn your camera off. Yes. Da -ba 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 -bum. And Sonia and Kara, if you wouldn't mind also turning your cameras off, we will share um, the, the PowerPoint just now. Thank you. you mentioned the Algonquin Club. Um, what kind of things went on there? Was the Algonquin Club was really organized to house, it was a sort of bed breakfast, to house insurance agents from the North Carolina Mutual so they'd have a place to stay when they came to town. Mm -hmm. But it evolved into a social organization too. During the day, dear Mrs. Bessie Alva Johnson Whitted, 
who was a an officer in the North Carolina Mutual, saw to it that young people had a social life in there. Mm -hmm. She was sort of a mother to us all, just teaching us social graces, how to dance, how to eat correctly at the table. All of us did not get that at home. Parents were too busy trying to make a living and you know, provide the necessities of life. But Miss Bessie, everybody called her Miss Bessie, saw to it that there was a place where you could go and get the social graces and learn how to think for yourself. Learn how not to do something just because everybody else was doing it, but think for yourself and do what was best for you and best for the community. There was a dear lady, a Mrs. Mary Newby, who stayed in the Algonquin Club and provided meals, not only for the agents who came through, but for anybody who wanted to stop off and have a lunch or dinner for a very small fee. There were tennis courts behind the clubhouse and a swimming pool, which was a boon and a blessing because we weren't allowed to go to the city pool. It just was something that didn't happen until the 50s. We didn't realize that our tax money was going to provide the city pools, mm -hmm. but we weren't allowed to go to them. And that group of youngsters that came along in the 50s and did the nonviolent protests, even went to jail, non-resistant, but just said, this is not right, and it must change. Mm -hmm. My daughter was one of them. She was in Atlanta at the time, in Spelman. She stayed in jail in Atlanta 18 days to open up the government cafeteria mm -hmm. in the government building there. Mm -hmm. And it opened up. She made the best grade she ever made because the citizens of Atlanta rallied around those kids, took their books to them, saw that they got their lessons, that their lessons were passed back to the school, and that their assignments for the next day were, were there. I must have lost 18 pounds while my child was in jail because she says, Mama, you stay in jail, please. <laughs> we're handling this down here. Don't come down here. No, that was hard. It was, it was, but I realized, even then I realized that they were doing a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And most of the youngsters these days don't realize that there were days when you could not darken a white bank, mm -hmm. a white store, a white restaurant, and for heaven's sake, no white hotel or motel. We had to walk. No such thing as blacks riding a school bus. And after that primer, we moved to Albany. I was six years old. And as I related, went into started in second grade. At Hazard Elementary School. And things were looking up school-wise, we had, hand, like I said, uh, hand-me-down books, but we had some of the best teachers because, you see, blacks realizing that education was the key to freedom, blacks were trying to get their children as much education as those children would get. Parents would sacrifice and pay the money. There weren't any grants and send their kids to college after they finished high school. My mother mentioned the fellows. Most of the guys, it was a male role model to sacrifice, in many cases. Let the girl go for higher learning, and he worked 
he worked the farms. He helped his father. He worked the farms to try to make money. Schooling was for the girls in many instances. So more girls finished college than did black men. Is that true? Uh, was that, are you speaking now in rural areas or rural urban areas? areas or both? Rural areas. Now, that was not the same way in, in urban areas. I would say it was a general practice, even in rural areas to a certain extent, that the men go to work. If you didn't have your own job, work for the man and make some money. Be a provider for the household. This was the man's role. But you, you said earlier that, 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 that education was seen as a way up, and, and I, I'm wondering why it was that education then was, was somehow privileged for women, but, but, but not for men. To go and become teachers, to come back and teach the next generation. Okay. The few men who went and there were only certain jobs available during interrogation. If you weren't going to be a teacher, you could get in a job as an insurance person, selling insurance. Uh, my father worked at the post office for a while. That was, ooh, that was privileged to work, working for the federal government. This was when now? When my father worked at the, worked at the post office, my mother made mention of while here. Uh -huh. Because Albany was the little metropolitan, metropolitan of the area. Right. And uh, there were many more jobs available in Albany. In the 40s, black men, many of them came from the rural. They still had embedded in them that love and respect for each other and that feeling of brotherhood. And in the 40s, black men in Albany, Georgia, Mm -hmm. were more productive than in any city south of Atlanta, Georgia. Matter of fact, the black men in Albany, from, a, from an industrial point of view, was in competition with Atlanta, Georgia. You had black businesses. This was in the late 40s and in the 50s. My father bought this supermarket. This was a self-service supermarket. You know, open meats, mm -hmm. had a butcher, professional butcher, who cut and prepared the meats, and you go in, and you got a buggy, mm -hmm. and you got your groceries. And that was because of hard work. There were other men who had insurance companies. There were other men who had grocery stores, men who owned taxi cab companies, men who owned dry cleaning business, men who owned... Uh, Something like a Dairy Cream, the ice cream, you know, curl. Sure, you had men running those businesses. You wow. had more businesses, black men owning their own business and and furnishing jobs for other blacks than you have now. Right. And it was, I think, because of the fact people were God-fearing, Thank you so much. Uh, and I want to note that uh, Brianna Magruder is my co-conspirator in this, this wonderful uh, panel discussion and conference. Uh, she is our Behind the Bill outreach intern for this academic year and uh, finishing up her Master of Library Science at UNC Chapel Hill and has done a magnificent job of coordinating with all of our participants today uh, and getting them on schedule. So uh, with that, I am going to open up our second panel, and I'll ask, I see Annie's got her video on, I'll ask Michelle and Lori and Sonia uh, to, uh, and Kara to turn their videos on, and I'll do some brief introductions and then turn it over to Annie Volk uh, to moderate this, this panel on experiences from the field, conversations with Behind the Veil interviewers. So Annie Volk, our moderator, is the director of American Social History Project and Center for Media and Learning. Uh, 
at uh remind me of the institution again Annie I'm sorry at, at CUNY at the CUNY Graduate Center thank you so much uh Sonia Ramsey is professor uh Department of History and director of the Women's and Gender Studies program at UNC at Charlotte uh, Kara Turner is Vice President of Enrollment Management and Student Success at Morgan State University. Uh, Lorraine Green is Associate Professor of History in the College of Liberal Arts at uh, University of Texas at Austin. And Michelle Mitchell is Associate Professor of History at New York University. Uh, this panel will go on through till about 2.45, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And so as questions come to you all in the audience, please feel free to drop a question into Q&A, and I will turn it over to you, Annie. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, Brianna, for uh, both of you for your excellent work pulling all of this together and tracking down so many people. Uh, it's nice to see everybody and it's wonderful to have the chance to lay my eyes on and uh, to have a chance to talk with some of the people whose role in the Behind the Veil project was probably um, the most important or among the most important. And also I think in many ways, probably the most challenging. Uh, in terms of being the folks who are actually out in the field conducting interviews and collecting other materials. Before I ask them all to introduce themselves, I want to, uh, like Paul, acknowledge Ray Gavins and Leslie Brown, who both were so critically important to conceptualizing and coordinating the project uh, in so many ways over the years. Also, Iris Hill, who um, I'm sorry can't be with us today, but certainly in my memory of working on the Behind the Veil project was another very key person. Uh, and in addition to Ray and Leslie, uh, there were two other folks uh, that I know of who were field workers who have passed away um, since then. Greg Hunter, who was involved in the project uh, and who got sick actually while he was doing field work and passed away. And then Felix Armfeld, who has passed away more recently than that, who was uh, in Louisiana with Michelle and Kate. So um, just uh, acknowledging the absence of um, so many people whose uh, labor and, and ideas and brilliance and energy and sweat was important to making this project work. So it's my pleasure to be here with four of the field workers who were involved in doing interviews with the Behind the Veil project. And to start things off, I wanted to ask them all to introduce themselves and to just give you a sense of uh, who they are now very briefly, but also who they were when they became associated with the Behind the Veil project. So um, I have asked them to start in alphabetical order by their first name. So Kara, you get to start us off. Thanks, Annie. Um, it's so good to see you and Sonia and Dr. Chafe, Dr. Korsted, Paul, people haven't seen in a really long time. Um, so I'm Kara Turner, I'm Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Success at Morgan State University in Baltimore. So that's who I am now, um, who I was, and I've been out of history, I've been doing administration for probably 20 years so now, so I haven't done a whole lot in a long time with my history uh, well, I do stuff with my history degree all the time in terms of critical thinking and, and writing skills and things, but I'm not uh, in the field uh, anymore, so to speak. Who I was then, I was Kara Miles, and I was probably 21, 22 years old. I was just finished, I think, my first year of graduate school and uh, got just thrown into a fire. <laughs> it was great. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but it was, it was a, yeah, my, just finished my first year of graduate school at that time, so. And, and just for people who don't know, you were a graduate student at Duke. 
Yes, at Duke under Dr. Gavins, took a lot of classes under Dr. Chafe as well. Great. Thank you, Kara. Lori. Hello. It seems fitting, Annie, that um, that um, I'm on a panel with you chairing because that was kind of like where I where I started, <laughs> in a certain sense. My trajectory um, is, uh, I think, quite different than others. So, um, in 1995, I was in graduate school at the University of Chicago, which is far from uh, Duke and Chapel Hill, and where the different places. In the I-95 corridor where, you know, a lot of the people went, went to school. Um, and I was in, just starting my work on the dissertation that had the, the big name of battling the plantation mentality, consciousness, culture, and the politics of race, class, and gender. So it had a big, a big name um, and goals. And I had begun to do my um, do my research and was uh, planning a summer of oral histories in 1995. I took a preliminary trip in the spring and found out from someone in Memphis about that the team of Behind the Veil people, including Paul, who's here, um, Paul Ortiz, had, had been to Memphis and, and I had never heard of the project, um, but I got in touch and met with um, Annie and Leslie in, I think, a soul food restaurant in Memphis um, in on May 22nd, um, 1995. And, and, and we, I was so excited to be able to connect with this much, much larger project. And in, um, and we agreed that I would donate my oral histories in exchange for $1,000 <laughs> that summer. Um, and the commitment to not making them public, which is, I guess, unlike some of the others, not making them public until I was um, for several years until I was complete, had completed my dissertation. Um, so I wound up um, doing, uh, donating a, a roughly 20 oral histories, and um, they were mostly with um, women who had migrated uh, from the rural Delta area into the city um, as young women and and then gone on. Um, and I just, you know, just really briefly I'd say that uh, the the impact is with me every day. Um, in fact, on the new book that I'm writing on the discovery of hunger um, in America in the 1960s and 70s, I'm going back to some of the same um, oral histories and digging out my notes. Um, so, and then I also have started a big oral history project at University of Texas on Austin women activists. So I'll leave it there. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura. I look forward to hearing more. Michelle. Good to see you, Annie, um, and everyone. I started in the project in the summer of 1994. I was then a graduate student at Northwestern, so also in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And the way I found out about it was my advisor, Nancy McLean, gave me this fire and said, oh, this is something you should apply for. And I instantly knew that I wanted to do it because I grew up, I grew up in the Southwest, but my family's from the South, and I grew up listening to stories about segregation. So I instantly knew that I wanted to do this. And I was on my way to a residential fellowship at the Woodson Institute in Virginia. And so it was just a sort of a great bridge. And um, I will say more about the impact of the experience during our session, but I use these interviews um, in teaching and it's just phenomenally successful and I think meaningful for the students. So that's something that I hope I have a chance to talk about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Sonia. Hello, everyone. I'm Sonia Ramsey. I um, am a professor of history at UNC Charlotte and the director of the Women and Gender Studies Program. So um, how, the impact, well, I just got, um, how I found out about the project, I just finished my 
thesis, but I had no idea what to do for the dissertation. And the great Jacqueline Hall said, gave me this information. She said, you should do this. And I actually said, oh, I don't know. But she said, you should do it. You should do it. So <laughs> I decided to do it. Um, and it was just changed my whole trajectory about history. I, I, I'm an oral historian, trained historian. Both my books have been the foundation of oral history. And during the project, I seem to always end up interviewing teachers by random. And I just feel that that was my home. So I do educational history. Uh, my recent book is, I actually use some of the interviews of um, Kathleen, Kathleen Crosby for my, for my actual book. So, and I was like, oh, but I wish I'd asked better questions when I was down there. So, but <laughs> about 20 years, 30 years before. So it was a great project. It was a great transformative project. And I'll talk, I can talk more about the impact later too. So. Great. And uh, Lori had a chance to talk about where she was doing her interviews, but Kara and Michelle and Sonia, do you want to um, just say a little about where you were doing your field work? We were the first group, I believe, and we were doing our field work in the state of North Carolina. So I'm sure we um, had some hits or misses and it, I, I feel things later on probably just went so much smoother, but we were a ragtag group of folks and uh, Annie and um, Annie and uh, y'all just were so patient with us because I'm sure we were a handful, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're grown up now, we're grown up now. So, but that was interesting. so I'm sure that I'm just, I mean, I, I'm sure we got on their nerves a lot, but we learned to, um, we travel together to different parts of North Carolina and um, we got followed around and we we just got to be most fascinating people but we got to the cities and rural areas so it really gave me a, a good foundation of doing southern history which I love so I you know I'll end it I'll let people talk so <laughs> and I was with Sonia and uh being part of that group that I'm sure indeed drove Annie and Leslie crazy but we do again I everything Sonia said about your patience uh as we were learning our way through this. Uh, so I think we were Charlotte, New Bern, Enfield, and I can't remember the others. Wilmington, Wilmington okay. and Charlotte, right? New Rome too, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and then my team, we were in New Orleans and New Iberia, Louisiana. Right. Uh, yeah, so feel free as as we uh, continue on, um, talk more, because I, I do think, uh, Lori, although your experience was different in terms of your connection to the project, that one thing that seems clear from my standpoint as somebody who was coordinating the project was everybody's ex experience was different. Uh, even when you were working closely together, uh, you were experience, you were encountering different people, learning different things. Um, the experience of people in different locations really differed dramatically as well. So I'm sure that the audience would love to hear more about um, the, the specifics of your projects and your experiences. So you all touched on this a little, um, but I wonder if you could say some more about what inspired you to give up a summer uh, to work on the Behind the Veil project. And what did you think that you were going to get out of that experience? Uh, for me, I think, uh, I think Ray Gavin said, you should do this. And <laughs> that was, uh, which meant this is what you need to do. And, you know, it's a very genteel way of saying things, but yeah. So uh, I think he kind of told me in his, in his very civil and genteel way that this is what you need to spend your summer doing. Uh, and so I didn't really, I had not done oral history previously. I think we, didn't we do a class right in, in preparation for this? So I'd had no experience previously, but I was also in my first year, so I didn't really have any like, okay, I know I want to focus on this or whatever. So I was a blank enough slate, I think, that it was like, okay, this is cool. I can do this for a summer. And I'm very glad I did. I think for me, um, my mother grew up in near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Her father was a, a steel worker who was from North Carolina. And listening to stories that he would tell about migration, but also segregation, that was critical. But so too were my father's stories. My father was from East Texas. And he would say to me at points, um, 
you don't know what it's like to not be able to go someplace. Um, and that was something that I wanted to find out more about that sort of impact of having it reinforced in so many myriad ways that you were a second class citizen. Um, that's what I, what I wanted to learn more about, but I also saw it as an opportunity to do oral history. My dissertation was on late 19th, early 20th century, and I just saw this as an unparalleled opportunity to do something that I really wanted training in. Oh, I'll go. Um, so Dr. As I mentioned, Dr. Jacqueline Hall suggested that I did it. Also, Dr. Gavins, I had done oral histories for my thesis, um, and I, but I had some personal issues. I had been um, diagnosed with MS about two or three years before, and that was before medicine, and I didn't know how to really handle my illness, so I was nervous for that. What would I have to encounter during the time? But um, my friend, Christine Stewart, I wish she could be here, who's also a member, um, she was doing it, so I thought she would do it. I would be okay, so I went to do it, but I'm sure um, I did not disclose my illness, so I'm sure they thought I was just a princess or something, but because they're not supposed to be in the heat and all these different things, but um, I I, I, I grew as a person through that process. How could I say, you know, how do I, met? I know that I could do things. So that was very helpful. But um, I did, um, the, the oral histories were so fabulously enriching um, to learn about these people's lives and their struggles and also the joys that they have. We're often taught about the oppression and the discrimination and it's very real, but they had just the most fun sometimes too. So I was, I just was such an enriching experience and to uh, grow as a person in how I handled my personal life too as well, so. Well, I, I was, um, had been thinking a lot about wanting to know more about not just what happened, um, the fa the facts, um, <clears throat> the um, in a certain sense, not only the the what but the who and the where, so the more factual aspects of those five Ws, but um, but but also how and especially why. So I kind of was motivated by the question of of why of why did people take the risks that they did in um the black freedom movement um and oral history was um and having conversations with these women some of whom i talked to for years because, because i went to over and over and they became kind of part of my thinking about the dissertation for quite a, quite a while and for quite a while afterwards um and so and and also there was so little documented on 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 Memphis and um and the question of why went into um you know not just labor issues but other kinds of questions related to why women migrated and um a lot of surprises there uh and ask people um given the 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 um slogan of the sanitation strike i am a man what did that mean to you as a woman because it was women who sustained that strike um and i hadn't even really decided that i would concentrate fully so so much not fully but so much on women but it turned out that 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 their stories were just so important for understanding these struggles from the 40s to the 60s that that i wrote about um in not just um what we recognize as civil rights and, and labor struggles but but a lot of of everyday life um so it was that it was that question of why of meanings of freedom um, that that really motivated me, and I did not know what I would find. <laughs> That's a a wonderful segue. I would love to have people talk a little more about this combination that I'm hearing from all of you in some way about uh, pers real personal motivations as well as intellectual questions and more academic interests that were 
driving you. So once you arrived in North Carolina, New Iberia, um, Memphis, how were those questions shaping the way that you approached doing your interviews? And I, I wonder as part of that, are there particular interviews that stand out in your mind as, um, well, I'll just leave that there. And feel free to just jump in and, or don't answer if you uh, feel like you want to just move on. I think to some degree, I realized that being a doctoral student could be perceived as a liability. Mm -hmm. Um, and that to sort of underplay that aspect of myself when going to churches. Um, Kate and Felix and I went to so many churches in New um, in New Orleans, um, to a lesser extent, New Iberia. And we would hand out the flyer with our names um, and our phone numbers. And um, we would dress respectfully, but we would try to dress not to, not in such a way that we were sort of wearing our class on our bodies. Um, so I think that was something that I really became aware of very quickly. Um, even though like Sonia, I interviewed a lot of educators, many, many educators, many educators who rather than being educated in Louisiana were sent to places like Columbia to keep teachers college. <laughs> but that's when, that's one thing that, um, that sort of, I realized when we hit the ground. Um, I have, it's. I remember I, I, there were people that I don't remember like what our conversation was about, but I remember they were just so much fun. Like they were just distinct characters <laughs> and they were great people just to talk to and just, just listen to. And sometimes you couldn't control the interview. Like they were gonna talk about what they wanted to talk about. <laughs> um, one, one thing I really distinctly remember and I, I don't remember who first said it, but the theme of, I remember the first time someone said to me, black schools were better under segregation, right? Because your, your whole thought, right, you hear is, oh, they had second class books or they didn't have books and they didn't have school buses and they didn't have this and they didn't have that. And that was just like, wow, like this is a black, I think she probably was a teacher, but I, I'm not, can't remember now to say, no, schools were absolutely <laughs> better than our teachers cared about us and they pushed us and they knew we had to be better than everybody else and they really made us excel. And that was, that was revolutionary to my thinking. Yes, I, I have several, several stories. I often edit, uh, interview teachers and I've got that same perceptions as well, but also how much of status they had in their communities. And um, actually my, I had to dress up for them. They, 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 I had to do different things, but they um, would be on the phone. You know, I'm being interviewed right now, you know, call each other about the interviews. Um, I, well, funny thing, I'm not a driver. So I dro drove into one um, person's house. He had this um, driveway over this kind of ravine, ravine. And I, I was trying to get my recorder and I drove off the thing. And so her phone call, who's the person on, is your car is off the thing. It was so embarrassing, so <laughs> embarrassing. But um, I was like, I did get the interview though. I got the interview and, and a tow truck after that. But <laughs> I also, that's a funny, the craziest. I got chased by dogs a little bit. Um, um, another person, I interviewed a gentleman and his wife was looking around the cur curtain and then she just kind of eased on in. I, entered, I I didn't know the rules, but I ended in the interviewing both of them because it, it was very interesting. Um, I interviewed a, a, a great, May I principal and I was talking, he was talking about the constitution. And I said, but we what what's your take on that? And he just really started crying. He started, there were tears in his eyes because his students, he could take a talk about it, but the students didn't experience the benefits of it. Um, and he was just very eloquent. Some people spoke in sound bites. I'm like, okay, that's a risk. Yes. Um, I interviewed these two ladies that did the makeup for funeral homes and they were the most characters and they was like we made them look real pretty we made them look pretty I was waiting for another body I hope somebody dies so I can get another body I was like oh my goodness um but they were giving me dating advice that I didn't ask for and things so um I, I learned from them I learned also how to be trained but sometimes you have to be flexible and you know go with them because sometimes what they're talking about is we just didn't know is so important so that was how to be flexible was also mm -hmm. interesting too also a, a thing to learn because I was like, oh, I didn't ask you this question, but, um, and some people were 
didn't want their everything, their answer was fine, mm -hmm. fine, fine. And try to break through the fine was hard to, hard to do. So I definitely took those skills when I did my research, very much so, it trained me to do that. And that's how I was able to talk to T4 about other books. You know, I always do oral histories because I think it's a component of recent history. Um, and so um, this was just such a great training ground. Um, and sometimes people would know some of the people I interviewed and that helped me get a foot in the door as well. So it's just been, it was such an um, exhilarating experience. I, I'm, you know, once in a lifetime, I think so. Yes. I don't think I knew about your car in the room. <laughs> That's just an incredible story, Sonia. Oh, my God. oh, I have one more story, and this is good. So I got to interview the great granddaughter of Robert Small. So I was so excited. I sat in the waiting room of the nursing home, and the little people were touching my face. And I'm like, hey, okay. So I go in to do the interview, and it's great. And I get them to sign the release form, and it had Duke on it. And she just was not a fan of Duke. But I said, actually, I'm from UNC. But she said, get out, both of you. I don't like either school. So I didn't take the interview. Yeah, no. I also had another great interview, a man, but he mumbled and he didn't have his teeth in. And it was so great that Leslie's like, we can't use this. I was like, okay, well, but it was good. But no, didn't have his teeth. So I had lots of interesting, funny, and sad stories, but the being thrown out. I was like, really? I just did the, she was like, get out. I said, like, okay. <laughs> well, your, those stories and Michelle, your discussion about, you know, kind of being aware of how you were wearing your class, um, you're just making me think like from the perspective of Leslie and I, like we very much had this experience where we did what we could in a week before you, while you were in Durham, before you went on the road. And then we handed you all a car, a set of car keys and a bunch of cassette tapes and interview packets and like, a, you know, some lists of names of people and wave goodbye. And it was largely up to you all to figure out then how to find people, how to uh, get people to agree to be interviewed, how to explain the project to them. So I wonder if there are other things that come to mind about negotiating that process or lessons that you learned about how to talk to people about the importance of what you were doing. You know, I, I I thought I might jump in as um, you know, what it meant to to be a um white uh doctoral student um and kind of ch chime in with what y'all are saying about coming from in some cases fancy universities. Um and I I found that given that I was kind of driven by certain questions and how important it was to just really kind of listen and really want to know what their thinking and experiences were. I found that by um, just, you know, talking to them originally, I mean, I think this is a matter of ethics too in oral history to like just very, really make plain your goal and for and for me it was explaining a little bit about my project. I was trained some by George Chauncey, who did a ton of had done a ton of interviews for his work on Gay New York. Um, and so I just really talked to people about what I wanted to do. And I had these, you know, initial on the phone interviews with people. And um I don't think that anybody turned me down. Um, I also think, and then also these were life histories, but also kind of motivated by the fact that I was writing about, um, you know, different kinds of movement struggles, all kinds of struggles. Um, uh, so th that, that might be a little different. Um, and it's interesting that when I, when I um, re have read various transcripts that <clears throat> I think there, there are some differences in, you know, what, 
what we what we emphasized, um, where we went to find people. Um, but I I found that you know people thought beforehand and and um, were um, it, it was just um, so great really to kind of have these conversations uh, uh, meaningful to me. So I I kind of was ex, you know sort of explicit about who who I was and why they were important to me. Right. And, um, you know, promise people to send the book and all that. <clears throat> I think that one of the, I mean, what Sonia said about um, Robert Smalls' granddaughter really having a negative reaction to the release form, I had some negative reactions along those lines too. People saying, well, you know, these institutions are going to, Duke is going to, you know, sort of profit off of this. What does this mean in terms of our communities? It was so smart to decide to leave copies of what we were collecting in those communities. That meant a lot to people. Right, and right. that was a real selling point to so many people is that that, what, that's what, that was going to happen. And so some people then came to see it as leaving a legacy for their communities. Um, so I think that that was just such a smart move. And I just want to just note before I'm completely mistaken that we did dress up for our interviews. Um, <laughs> just, just not so, so we wanted to show respect to people. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, the question at the end of the last session, um, about negative, um, impacts in new Iberia, we handed out, you know, those flyers with our names and the phone number. And I got back to the hotel room and the phone rang and I pick it up and there's this genteel sounding woman who said, you intellectual carpetbaggers need to get the blank out of town. Um, if you stay here, you, you know, you, you're only at your own fault for what's happened, what might happen to you. And we said to our local contact, um, Captain Nathaniel Mitchell, you know, what should we do with this phone call? And he said, don't take it seriously, but don't blow it off. And so that was um, something that stuck with me as well as some people who wanted to make sure that their interviews would not be released to the public because they were afraid of repercussions. Um, so some of the sort of sensitive aspects of doing that work stick out in my mind. Um, I remember um, we, I had, and some others had a tendency of getting um, subjects that were kind of upper middle class or middle class. And we wanted to see if we could bury that. And I think we were in a lunchroom in Charlotte and this guy, this older gentleman was just sitting around and we were like, can we interview you? He said, yeah. So um, we were just trying to grab people sometimes, but I think um, the process of telling them about the project and the, the legacy, it's also that they were already in the community and things were being done in addition to the interviews for the community, working with nonprofits as well. I think that helped give us an okay. But and after we got one person, they would suggest another to be interviewed. Um, so I think we, I wish we could have maybe cast a net and get some people that weren't in these circles, but um, I think we did the best we can with what we had to, if we had another, another time, we would get different social, social economic groups. But I think we got as much as we could. I might have just ended up with, like I said, I just always ended up with the teachers, um, but they weren't really that well paid, you know, well paid either. But the status that they had was um, interesting to think about too. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you all were getting tapping into these networks, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, with the idea like you never leave until leave someone until you get a suggestion for someone else. Right. Yes, um, yes. And, and I wound up in some really really interesting networks, um, but. Um, but my initial contacts were people who um, were kind of uh, known through activist uh, circles. And one thing that was that was really helpful in learning more about um, kind of everyday life that impacted me was um, was I mean I was I was um, I was in my own little group. <laughs> And I really missed the the folks having them there um, and being part of a team. But um, but I held a I got in touch with a senior citizen center and then um, got them to gather people 
So we held a big meeting, maybe 20 women were there and I asked some questions and they were all chiming in. I mean, it was just amazing conversation um, that I can't remember if I taped it or not, but, but then I just asked uh, if people would volunteer. Um, and so several women volunteered and, um, and that wound up having a big impact. Like, like one of those women, Lovey Mae Griffin had, um, been like many others, a migrant from the, from rural West Tennessee, which like imagine Mississippi. It's, you know, that's what, that's what it was like. Um, and she talked about being a teenager in this, uh, this neighborhood and how the, the police were always hounding them, um, these, these teenagers and, um, that, you know, sometimes there was, there were incidents of police, police brutality, certainly harassment. Um, and it, it, uh, it, it made me think a lot about this kind of transition from the kind of violence that there might be in the, um, say the Delta in rural areas to the forms in a city um, as well as like just you know what it was like to be a teenager in, in the city um, and the kinds of um, areas of life that got politicized or that would have an impact later in life like later they might be part of something um, so 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 that helps kind of help me get into these realms that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten into. <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm struck by the different the difference in what you can do. Um, Sonia and Kara, you both were in five sites over the course of a summer, so essentially two weeks per site. Michelle, you were in two locations, and Lori in one. So um, I think we as project coordinators in a way learned over time that five sites in a summer is too much <laughs> both in terms of uh like the experience of the field workers in kind of moving around that often but also what that means in terms of your ability to actually do a lot of the legwork that you're talking about Lori and finding different additional circles of people to get connected to and to be able to explain and have your your face and your project known amongst those circles in in different ways. Uh, so I think that that certainly uh, for Kara and Sonia, you were then much more reliant on whatever legwork Leslie and I had been able to do before you showed up and less on your, um, and just had less time to spend building your own networks and connections. Yes, I mean, it sounds like we had quite different experiences in, you know, subsequent years, but, you know, mm -hmm. it was great being the guinea pigs. Are there, are there other particular interviews that stand out as, uh, as a, an encounter with somebody who really taught you something about history that you've held on to? You know, I, I went back and um, I found the, uh, the notebook that, that I had and in 1995 and that's why I knew the date when I when I met with um Leslie and, and Annie and um I I just wanted to I I thought I was kind of amazed so I was so excited at the end of this summer of interviews or this um like four weeks of interviews I was so excited and I was so I was driving home from Memphis to Chicago which is pretty much a straight shot um and so uh as I was going Cross the bridge over the Mississippi, and then it's you know just straight through 
um, Arkansas and Missouri and, and all. And so I'm, I'm writing. Whenever I talk to students about this, I say, like, don't follow this. But I was, like, writing uh, my ideas out while driving. And um, that's, like, I just couldn't wait. And, and I just wanted to read a little bit. Um, uh, also need to show how many of these women had previously rejected first sharecropping and then private housework. Time after time, women had made such decisions, even if it threatened their relationships with their husbands. Time after time, women had quit or gotten themselves fired or abruptly um, left, only to face this from jobs in the city, only um, to then face the same kinds of issues or jobs in laundries and small manufacturing plants that they might have, say, as domestic servants. Um, but then once in a plant, in the context of the 60s, there was a possibility of collective discussion, critique, action. Um, even in taking action, they avoided Uncle Tom-like workers, um, employed secrecy from the uh, bosses, were careful uh, about uh, not losing their tempers. Um, we need to analyze the particular concerns of women rooted in this history. So um, you can see like that was, um, th those were big things. And I think that my interview with Sally Turner, um, a who had been a worker in one of these factories had come from a plantation. Um, a lot of this was her story that was impacting me. And um, her story begins my book, uh, Battling the Plantation Mentality. So um, just, I mean, that was big. Those those um, thoughts there reflecting her and a number of oral histories, that was big for me. Thank you. I think that um, in terms of, I've got a number of favorite interviews. Adrian Augusta in New Iberia, um, I spoke with him two or three times. He was a photographer, but he was also an educator. He talked a lot about um, the NAACP effectively being sort of driven underground during World War II, um, not being driven underground, but sort of coming out of the coming out of the woodwork a little bit. Um, and that was a great interview. And two of the ones that I remember really um, pointedly <clears throat> had to do with um, New Orleans. One is Brenda Bozon Davier, and the other one is Aileen Saint Julian. And both of them talked a lot about the sort of particular color dynamics in New Orleans. Um, in really complex ways. And Miss Bozon Davier is in the Remembering Jim Crow book. And I also learned from her about sort of spontaneous, um, but not so spontaneous protest when she led a kneeling in her in her church and then went to go give confession and got the confession door slammed in her face. Um, that was one of my favorite interviews. And um, going to meet her in this restaurant um, on Canal Street in New Orleans, um, I'll never forget because I'm walking in and I'm looking for her and I see this woman smiling at me and it takes me a while to realize that this woman who's smiling at me is my interviewee because I did not realize that she was African descended and mm -hmm. I felt really, really ignorant. Um, and listening to her talk about colorism was incredibly informative. I, I think for me, um, there are two, I'm trying to remember the names, I was trying to look up. One was the um, librarian in New Hanover County in Wilmington and during the desegregation process. And she talked about um, the, the, the students, how their experiences and how the experience of the educators felt as they left their segregated communities and had to um, um, integrate these, is these schools and the loss of black schools. And actually that probably was the foundation of the questions I asked when I did my first book on national teachers in desegregation. I, that, that story I felt just had not been explored. Um, another interview I had was quite different. It was a group interview. I can't remember, an older gentleman, older, older Black men, and they talked about how their experiences working. They worked so hard. They were laying bricks. They were farming. They were sharecropping. They just worked so hard for their families. Um, on one, um, even another interview, one talked about he would get these books to learn how to play the, the violin, to learn how to play this, all these extra side gigs they had to feel their families. And I just thought that story really 
um, how they just simply lived their life and try to make the best out of their lives had not really been explored. Um, other things, they they didn't join you. They weren't in unions. They were just hardworking. They didn't, but they just worked so hard, so hard for their families and for themselves. It was just an interesting interview to get that I idea of masculinity that was not discussed in a lot of ways. So I can't, um, I think if I read the names of interviewees, like I think I'll remember like one or two that because there are definitely some people in my mind, but again, it's been so long. I haven't done anything with this uh, in so long that I can't like call up people uh, right now who were um, particularly impactful, but just overall, um, it was impactful, right? Just just learning about people's interior lives, and um, because so frequently, like they're not talking about what event is going on, like things that make the history books for as having been important, right? But what's going on in what was going on in their family, and what was going on in, in their church, in their neighborhood, and their social life um, that just things add such a richness to our understanding of um, Black communities at that time. I want to ask um, one more question about your field experiences and then um, ask you to talk a little about impact. Um, but Bob Corsett just uh, posted a question in the chat. and. Uh, which I think is about something that as academics, we're not trained well enough to do, which is working in teams and collaborating. So I wonder if any of you have thoughts about um, what it was like to be part of a team uh, of people working on this project and how did you actually work as a team um, to support each other's work or to process what you were learning. Lori, this is probably less relevant for you, I'm afraid. Although if you have thoughts, please jump in. Well, I, I'll start. I It was a um, unique experience. I've never had that opportunity to work in a group to do historical research. Um, usually you're just sent all in your archives and you're all by yourself and it's sort of isolating. So it was very, um, comforting to go back in your interviews and be able to talk about it with the other um, team members to see how their interviews are going to help improve yours or are any inter interesting incidents that you had or are things that we think we learned from each other we don't need to do again or are to do. So I think it was very helpful. I think it would have been really quite isolating to go by myself to do all those places. I, I wouldn't even think that would be a very isolating experience. So I think that it was very helpful to be in the group and to see how other people worked and did their research was firsthand was also interesting. I really strongly agree that the group was critical. And one thing that I won't go too much in depth about is just how emotionally hard some of the interviews were and to be able to decompress and process with your team members was, I mean, Felix and, and Kate were, were wonderful. Um, and sometimes working in a team when we would go to churches um, and we would all want to maybe interview one particular person. And we sort of learned how to sort of back off and let the person go towards who they were gravitating towards. Um, but sometimes there was like, oh, we really want to interview this person because they sound, we've heard about them in other, in other interviews. They sound so interesting. But really some of the, just the collaboration um, on that front, but also really just decompressing and processing and learning from each other what we were taking out of the interviews was just, it was absolutely invaluable. I think I remember Leslie and I getting called on to try and negotiate some of the issues in your team, Michelle, about who was going to interview particular people, but you figured it out. Kara, Laurie, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Well, no, I, 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 go ahead. Um, well, I would just add that, um, yeah, I was really missing that. And, um, and so I kind of made those people, the decompression and the exchanging of ideas and all that. I just, I was there long enough to just make those people, those that I had, you know, some of the people that I actually interviewed, um, who became, you know, who I spent a lot of time with. I mean, Ida Leachman took me to, took me out to 
Fayette County to go to union negotiation meetings. And we had a lot of time to talk on the way out there and back. She wanted, you know, this is, this is someone from University of Chicago. Um, and, and then I stayed with some people from University of Memphis. So I, I just had to, you know, kind of do that. But I, I love the idea that you all were in, in these teams. I just think that's fabulous. <clears throat> yeah, and I would just second what Sonia and Michelle said. The teams were critical. Just, you know, you're, you know, you're somewhere strange you've never been before, right? <laughs> you, um, and, and so it was just, it was good to have friendly faces to go back to in the evening and, and you know, and, and to be able to talk about things that you heard that were either like, again, really great and funny or sometimes really sad. And, and um, yeah, so I, I can't imagine having done that, not with a group. <laughs> Did you feel like you were connected to say the people in SNCC and CORE, you know, who just three decades earlier were out in communities that they'd never been in? Um, it, it was interesting when we were in Wilmington, we, the police followed us around and it was because you had black and white people working together and going to dinner together. It was not something that was the norm. Um, and that was interesting. I, we, I won't ever say we were like SNCC, but we, we thought we were, we were defying, uh, you know, bucking the system in our own way. Um, what's also interesting is that um, when you had the team, you could see how they would be able to get answers for certain questions, especially things about colorism or social class that I could not get, but I could get answers that they couldn't get. So it was interesting to see the role of the, interview, the interviewer in this process as well. So that's that is so true because Kate um, could get some material that neither Felix nor I could get. Um, and he could get material that we couldn't get. I mean, it was just so true. Yeah, and particularly as you're saying that, I'm thinking also that's partly individual identity and personality, but also the different kinds of expertise that you that you all brought. So, Sonia, I was thinking about Kara, or Karen Ferguson, who was really interested in rural life and agriculture and seemed like that kind of expertise meant that she was particularly interested in asking questions about farming and the kind of work that people were doing, which is different than the kind of expertise or interests that others of you had on your team. I think it matters too whether interviewees, I'm thinking here of women, um, if they imagine you as their grandchild or they don't. Um, so it's, you know, very conscious of it, this being intergenerational relationships and different meanings that that might have in terms of what people might say. Um, or not, or not want to say. I think that's very insightful, yeah. Because for me, this really was going, in many cases, going to sit in my grandparents' house and just, right? But so that that does then impact good, good or bad, what they're going to tell you, right? Things they're going to shield you from or things that they will let their hair down and and say that they may not say in some other situations. So. I think it was Kara who said this, who you talked about the woman sort of looking around the curtain and wanting to join, the, Sonia? Yeah, um, wanting to sort of join the conversation. That was really fascinating to see sometimes the, uh, the, re the relationships between spouses and then deciding to go ahead and do a joint interview. <laughs> it was really interesting. <laughs> Yes, I had to make up new, just make up new questions at the time, but it was, it was, she just did it in. So sometimes she was right there. It was so, I thought that was the funniest thing, but she wanted to get, she wanted to get in on the action. So I said, you can be in a few too. She's like, she's okay. But yes, it was interesting. Well, the, the comment about grand intergenerational relationships, um, I think is a good segue because something I've done a lot of teaching oral history in the years since the Behind the Veil project. And one of the things that I 
often find in uh, different kinds of oral history projects is that that is a strong motivation often for people to participate in an interview is this sense that their recognition that they'll be talking to a student and very a very strong sense of wanting to pass on certain kinds of insight to to a young person. Michelle, earlier you you mentioned using these materials in teaching. So I wanted to invite you all to talk about um, impact of this on your work as teachers um, and as educators, Kara, uh, including you in that. So how have you used the materials or the insights from your experience uh, in your in your later work as educators? I'll just start and say very quickly that I teach the both halves of the AFAM survey, and now I'm teaching the second half. And for their term paper, they have to engage remembering Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. But they also bounce it off of Mount McLaurin's separate past, growing up white in the segregated South. So they read that in its entirety. And then they I ask them to really read as deeply as they can in remembering Jim Crow and really sort of pick a theme out of that book to sort of think about how they can put it in conversation with McLaurin. But I also play the clips um, of interviews that were provided with initial editions of Remembering Jim Crow. And um, I even use one of the clips in a webinar about um, the, the suppression of, uh, of elections with the one man talking about croton oil, croton oil being used during a fish fry to give um, Black people digestive problems so that they wouldn't go out and vote. And one of my colleagues who's an Italianist Ruth Ben Ghiat said, you know that they did that in fascist Italy. And so it was just a really interesting connection. So I've used it for that with that, but also really with teaching. And the students get so much out of that book and out of those materials and the photographs as well. It's just, um, I never get tired of reading the term papers. I use them. Um, I teach African-American women's history. Um, and so one of their assignments is to do uh, oral history. So I use the Jim Crow book as a reference for them and also some of the clips as examples for them to do. Um, and so it's been very helpful um, in, in training them in a short way to be able to do these oral histories. And, and if they, you know, help, I help them format things. So they've been excited to do that. Oftentimes they do members of their own family. So um, that's interesting there. So she thought that you think you know your grandmother, but maybe you don't you know so you don't know everything they did so um I use I've always used them in my assignments but I actually used them in my research actually so too so um so while I, I haven't used the behind the veil interviews I have certainly used the oral history I, I decided to use oral history um in my dissertation so I did a lot of oral histories um in Prince Edward County Virginia uh, for my dissertation, and certainly the experience of having done behind the veil was absolutely invaluable to knowing how to do oral histories. Uh, so that was I certainly used it. I did what I did teach. Um, I did because I just think it's so it's just so important, right, to capture that history um, while people are still living. So I did also have my students always doing you know, if I was teaching a Black History class to interview somebody. Uh, your parent or a grandparent or somebody about their lives. Um, and I use the skills, right? I use the skills regularly, just asking, how, you know, how to ask open-ended questions. A lot of people don't know how to do that, right? And so just in any number of settings in work, I, I do that. The flexibility, thinking on your feet, because, yep, you got your list of questions, but they go this way and you, you got to go that way with them. <laughs> um, and just, it was, this, it was such an experience, right? I mean, we were going into people. We didn't know these people. They didn't know us. You go in, like, you just go to their house, and, like sitting there. So just um, just knowing how to say, okay, oh, I'm going to take this deep breath and I'm going to go do this, right? I think is something that's been valuable just professionally as well. I'm just going to do um, I, all of the above. Okay, all of the above. I really love what everyone said. I just want to do a shout out to um, the, I, I pulled out, um, I have copies of 
of all the forms that we had to fill out with people. Um, and I don't know if those are available online at the website, but I just want to have a shout out to those. It, they took a long time to fill out. But on the other hand, um, they they really did um, make the process transparent with people, having them sign off on different things and, you know, explaining what we were doing um, and getting light, uh, dates and, and life history information so that, you know, you could then put stories together with what they were going on in their lives. Anyway, I um, I think at the time I was sort of cursing them because it took so long to, to fill them out. And um, and I was always worried that I would like lose the person's interest. But um, uh, but I think that they they're they're really a model. Absolutely. This is one of the things you would have learned if you had been in a team was so many people did not have those forms very fully full, filled out, which I think, you know, does speak to both uh, how challenging it was because they were lengthy forms and often hard to get somebody to uh, spend time doing that after they have um, spent time with you being interviewed, but they're in, they are incredible resources in and of themselves. Right. I always did them before. Um, and I and I tell my students um, in the Austin Women Activist Oral History Project, I tell I I have a much shorter shorter one, um, and uh, but I tell them that they need to get them done before, and I increasingly it's not like a suggestion it's it's a mandate because when you get to the end of an oral history and it's fantastic and then the person says. Um, like someone did who was really important in the Chicana movement here and then said she hated University of Texas so much that she didn't want to donate her interview. And that has just, that stayed. Um, and so we had to destroy it um, or the live Briscoe Center for American History did. So at this point, you know, I, it's like, you know, if they won't sign off, then, um, then, uh, no, move for someone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, we have about 10 minutes left in this panel, but before we open this up to the q and I just wanna say thank you to Kara and Sonia and Annie and Michelle and Lori for being here and for sharing your insights as interviewers. I know that I have thoroughly enjoyed this, especially as a graduate student myself, engaging in oral history and feeling like a novice sometimes. So I really appreciate it. and. Um, yeah, I really do, again, implore the audience to share your questions so that we can get some more insight from this wonderful group of women. While we're waiting for questions, I will open up the question for you all. Um, now that you are all, 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 excuse me, now that you are all in positions of authority within your institutions, um, how would you recommend that new researchers go about exploring the Behind the Bell collection? Um, I would, um, when they have graduate students, they're looking for topics. I think exploring the behind the veil is a great way, if they're interested in this time, you know, this era and this field, um, of looking at the interviews for spark for idea sparks. Because um, what what do certain interviews say? What can they fill in? What's not been written about before? Because you know, the, even though it's several years, def decades ago, the, the content is still relevant and coherent today and so very rich. I, I would send them to those, look at those interviews and see if anything sparks your mind for a thesis topic or a research topic. Um, there's so many things that could be added to it. So that's one thing I would do, I think. I think that's really true. Um, one of my former graduate students uh, had a topic, but really wanted to look at young women growing up in New Orleans and their subjectivity during Jim Crow. And she went and she mined uh, the Behind the Veil collection. And Crescent City Girls by Lakeisha Simmons has been very well received. And so she really did that very effectively. So I completely agree with Sonia. Okay, we do have some questions coming in. Um, I will ask Beatrice Adams question, which is beyond your teaching, what do you see as the lasting impacts of the project? And what do you hope 
Um, and what hopes do you have for the project as it moves into a new phase? Oh, it has a profound lasting impact of just having that knowledge there, having that content. Um, many of those people are no longer with us. And um, that's their legacy, is their legacy, is these interviews. Um, I think moving forward, the ability to digitize them will make them so accessible and even uh, more, more available for people to do research. And in these times, we need to have the, we have to combat people with research and show what really happened. And I think if these are more, are more accessible, that public school teachers can access them, everyday people can access them, it's going to be just fabulous. So. Um, if I could jump into that as well, I I feel very inspired by the uh, availability of the audio. Uh, Michelle, you mentioned in addition to having people look at the book that you play clips of the audio, and I have both in teaching oral history and in other aspects of my research, I have just come to appreciate the importance of being able to listen and what it adds to the experience of learning um, to be able to access the audio. Uh, we were talking in the earlier session about the visual materials as well. So I think having all of the, those pieces of the project accessible is going to really open up other ways of thinking about how to how to make that accessible podcast, uh, other kinds of presentations of the work that can really deepen people's understanding of the history that it contains. I wanna build on this initial question because I think that Will Saxton in the Q and A section adds an additional depth to what we're talking about. He asks, when you were conducting the interviews, did you think much about how people might access the materials in the future? Yes. Um, I think that in critical regards, thinking about how they might be accessed in the future, especially within the local communities, I thought a lot about that. Um, I thought about it for what was going to be deposited at Duke. I mean, everything, but I really thought about it on the local side um, and the fact that it was going to just be there. And also thinking about, you know, what was going to be transcribed, what might not be, thinking about inter favorite interviews, um, but also just thinking about something that we talked about in our training, which was trying to be cognizant of mistakes that we might make in the field errors that we might make in the field, thinking about the WPA um, interviews. So thinking about all sorts of things about the future and the past were definitely on my mind. Um, well, that's not really answering the question as well as I think the person might want, but that's just what comes to mind. Uh, I think I'm just looking at the question. I think it's fantastic that they, the interviews are available. I'm looking forward to going back and listening <laughs> to them myself. Um, so I think it's just an incredible contribution um, to the historical record. At the time, I, def I mean, I definitely think we were cognizant because you were you, know, you were audio recording and you know you had to have the release form, so you definitely were aware that they would at some point be available somehow. But I don't know if I thought we would be at a point where we could just go online and just click one and, and listen to it as opposed to having to go to an archive and uh, somewhere um, to get it. But I think it's fantastic. Although it might be cringy going back and listening to some of them, we'll see. <laughs> we were the test group, just keep that in mind. Sonia and I were the test, we were the first group. Um, I, I, I'm following Kara, um, that wasn't my main focus of what would happen, but I knew some of them were, they were going to 
they were hot interviews, I call them. They were just so rich with historical information that I knew people would use these interviews. And I was trying to figure out ways I could use them eventually. Um, and I knew they're selling in the archives so people could access them. But, so that was great. And people, and I also thought about the things that we we had, I think we had a copy day or copy attic fairs and other things that helped the community. And I took those ideas. I went to live in Texas and I, um, well, my mother was a curate director of the African, the assistant director of the African American Museum in Dallas. And I said, why don't you do a copy day? Why don't you do this? And so I took some of the ideas and have them do that for their community there in Dallas. So I think um, that was training ground beyond just the oral histories on how to how to work with communities was excellent. And we were the test group. <laughs> Sonia, um, yes. are you saying that that you had transcripts and you got together people in the community to copy edit them to like look for mistakes is that oh no i'm sorry we take photographs or memorabilia oh okay here's our uh, things and we would take photo we take photographs of their photographs so we wouldn't take their photographs so or anything they wanted to do we um copy them we call the copy so especially for the museum if people had old quilts they didn't want to give us but you know just to tell the community to share your memorabilia is important to us so. It feels fitting to close the panel today with um, a question from Bob Korstad. And the question is, if you were going to do interviews this summer, what questions would you ask today of people who live during Jim Crow? I would, um, and I don't know how I would get to the information, but I wanted to know about gender and sexuality questions. Um, I don't think I asked any of those. Um, and I would like to know what, you know, because how would that community thrive during that time or survive during that time? And that's the biggest gap, one of the biggest gaps, I think, um, in my interviewing. So. It's such a great question. Um, I think I agree with Sonia again about gender and sexuality because I really was not that attentive to it um, in my own interviews. Um, I think one thing that I would probably ask more questions about would be about actually what we consider to be a sort of a post Jim Crow moment. Um, I might ask more questions about that um, when we think about resegregation. Um, the entrenchment of, of segregation in crit critical regards, whether it be education or elsewise. I might, I might ask questions about that, in part because in New Iberia, we had a number of people sort of pushing us going, you actually need to go further, you actually need to go further, you need to, you're stopping a little too early. Um, so I think that that's, that's perhaps what I would do. When, um, so I'm in this oral history project, that I've been doing, which is a, we're activists at the university in the 60s and 70s. There was a huge movement here. Um, and also in the community and the issue of like white is, is, is important. Um, and I, Laurie, it looks like you muted yourself. Will you please unmute? What was the last thing I said? Start from the top. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I think that the um, uh, geographic and cultural specificities are, are really important um, to um, be, be aware of kind of getting at um, Quite, uh, at issues around that um, so that there's not a sense of, you know, you look at this collection that was so diverse and in where people went and who they interviewed um, and wind up with an idea of the South um, and or race in the South. And I've become really aware of that in working on this Austin oral history project, which is both people at who were at UT and in the city and it's very black brown and white uh, and um, it just as an example people who were student activists were getting into were 
um, all about black power at a time when the university was still segregated because in supposedly progressive Austin, the um, university was one of the first to be desegregated in 1956, but none of campus life, dorms, nothing at all was desegregated also. And the final um, uh, bastions of segregation, it didn't end until the early seventies. So, um, so there's these ideas about civil rights and then there's the ideas clashing into these ideas about um, about black power and Chicano power, et, et, et cetera. Um, and so I think, yeah, um, that these, these specificities, you know, how, going at the interviews um, with that, with that in, in mind, um, now that there's so much more published and so much more that's accessible that you can have knowledge of before you go and start the oral histories. So I'm going to end this there. Thank you all so much for this wonderful afternoon of conversation and reflections on Behind the Veil. Uh, I remain excited about uh, not only this archive, but the stories that are in the archive and the people behind those stories and the research and scholarship that is yet to come. I I can't even begin to express how grateful I am to all of you for doing this work. Uh, behind the Villas is, is one of the most used collections in the Franklin Research Center. Um, and in terms of thinking about who might access this, I can tell you for certain from personal experience that I get phone calls and emails from people who say, you know, this is my grandmother. This is my aunt. I haven't heard their voice in 10, 20, 30 years. And I'm so grateful that this interview is here just so I can play and hear her voice. And I can also share that last November, I received a call from a gentleman whose mother uh, is Cassie Cloyd Smith. And she lived or she was interviewed in Enfield, North Carolina. So Karen, Sonia, you might have likely spoken to her, uh, he said that she was turning 108 years old and had heard the interviews. One of the cousins, a, a family member, found it online and shared it with her. And so it's not just the descendants that are, are able to access these interviews, but it's it's some in some cases, it is the people themselves. Um, and he said that she was still with us and was actually getting ready to celebrate her birthday a couple of weeks before he called me. Um, and so just that that story alone continues to resonate the importance of of this archive and the material therein. Uh, so I'm going to wrap us up for today. I want to thank everybody who attended and I want to thank all of our participants, Annie and Karen, Michelle, Lori, Sonia, uh, Bill, Paul, uh, Bob and Michael. And of course, Brianna, who's been behind the scenes and reading all of our Q&A questions. Uh, I want to encourage everyone who's still online with us to join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. We're going to have our second day of panels, and uh, the panel is going to be on researching behind the veil, scholarship, and new perspectives. So some of the, the the sort of the genesis of this panel is going to be uh, we have a lot of travel grants applicants who come in and use the archive, and they're bringing very different questions uh, to the archive than I think you all might have set out when you were talking with people. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about what their process has been like and the things that they've discovered, uh, which I think gives a just another adds another layer onto the richness of the stories in the oral history archive. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John.